you're doing demo stream. My phone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't touch your phone. You can't touch mine. Well, good morning and welcome. You know, whenever I give a talk at I.O., I always ask to be first thing in the morning because I know only the most motivated, smartest, best-looking audience comes. Give yourselves a round of applause for being here. So we're going to talk about building apps for the Google Assistant. If you know nothing about building apps for the Google Assistant, you're in the right place. Uh, this is meant to be an orientation talk, to give you a sense for what scenarios work, how to accomplish it, and then hopefully at the end of this talk will intrigue you to want to drill in more and find out more information. So I'm Brad Abrams, and I'm a product manager on the Google Assistant team. I'm Vera. I'm on the product partnerships team on the Assistant team. I'm Adam Coimbra, and I'm a partner technology manager on the Assistant. So when Sundar launched the Assistant at I.O. last year, he did so for one reason, and that was to build a conversational interface to all of Google. And we wanted that to be a single interface, regardless of what context you're in, what, what device you're in, or what uh, task you're trying to accomplish. So the way we think about the Assistant is that it's a conversation, and it's a conversation between you and Google designed to help you get things done in your world. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm personally so excited about the Assistant is it builds on Google's long history of creating ecosystems. And that history started actually with Google Search, where we created a strong ecosystem between publishers and readers. It continues with YouTube, where we have a strong ecosystem between creatives and their viewers. And of course, many of you know, on Play, uh, we created an ecosystem between Android app developers and their users. It's that exact same kind of ecosystem we're creating with the Google Assistant. And we, that ecosystem is enabled by a platform we call Actions on Google. So you might be interested in Actions on Google because it enables you to connect with a whole new set of users in different contexts, in different places, uh, everywhere the Google Assistant is. You can also connect to your existing users in new and different ways. And finally, it gives you an opportunity to innovate in a, a whole new computing domain, this domain of conversational interface, which we'll talk a lot more about in this talk. So since we launched the platform in December, we couldn't be more happy with the variety and creativity of apps for the assistant that we've seen. Whether you want to order a pizza from Domino's or play and name that tune with Song Pop, you can do a wide variety of activities. But I want to drill in on one in particular today to kind of give you the anatomy of one of these assistant apps. What's really, how do they work? What's really under the covers? So some of you may have noticed, uh, in addition to the Android ver version uh, of the Google I.O. app, we now have a Google Assistant I.O. app as well. So you're able to say something, talk to your assistant and say, OK, Google, talk to Google I.O. 17. And then the assistant looks at all the ways it could possibly respond, all the context, all the uh, possible different options, and picks the very best one for this user at this time. In this case, because the user used the app name explicitly, uh, IO17, then that's like a URL or tapping on a, uh, a shortcut on the desktop. And it brings us directly into our Google IO17 app. The user hears uh, the assistant give an introduction, and then hears an ear con. So an uh, ear con is to the ear what an icon is to the eye. It's a visual uh, uh, audio distinction to help the users understand there's a transition happening. And then there's a change in the voice, and the icons change. And there's a, now there's a two-way dialogue between the Google I.O. app and the user. And that two-way dialogue continues until either party is ready to exit. So that's how it looks on Google Home. But of course, we knew we were launching for phones here at the event, so we wanted to also make it work well on the phones. 
And there you see uh, it working on the phones, suggestion chips, and um, images and whatnot. Uh, in addition to that, we also wanted to let you book seats. Some of you may have noticed some of the sessions yesterday were kind of full. Uh, you, you might know you can actually uh, reserve seats to the sessions. So we wanted to let you do that transaction as well, to book a seat. So when a session comes up, you can click the suggestion chip, reserve a seat. And if you click that, we use our new seamless account linking to have you sign in. And then you, uh, even if you haven't created an account with just two taps, you can go and create an account. Uh, then you see your receipt. And of course, it's free to reserve a seat. So that's fine. Uh, and the transaction is complete. So actually, what we're going to do is walk through the end-to-end -end experience of building that app I just showed you in this session. I'm going to start off by talking about the design process. How did we come up with that app? What was the design that went into it? Uh, Adam then is going to go through the hardcore development of it, both the natural language understanding part as well as the uh, transactional part of it, and show you in code how to go build that. And then Veer is going to show how, how to make that app discoverable, how you can get people to actually use that app. OK, let's drill into design. But first, you know, do we need design at all? I mean, these conversational apps, uh, these assistant apps, I mean, they're, they're just chatbots, right? I mean, it's text input, text output. There's no images. There's no forms to lay out. There's no CSS to do. Do you need design at all? Well, consider a very simple case. Say we wanted to reserve a, a number of seats, a number of seats at a restaurant. How might we handle this case? Uh, we say, for how many? Look at the wide variety of ways that a user might respond to this query. How are we supposed to handle each one of these cases? Well, the answer, of course, is in the design. But what is the nature of design for these assistant apps? Well, Oren Jacobs of PullString coined this phrase, interactive screenwriting, which I think fits perfectly what we're trying to build with these assistant apps. With, when you build an assistant app, it's kind of like you're writing a screenplay, like for a movie or a TV show where you're writing dialogue, except you get to write lines 1, 3, 5, and 7. And somebody you have no control over gets to write lines 2, 4, 6, and 8. Uh, and you have to use that to come together with a, a beautiful experience. And to do that, you have to pull together uh, design elements from two different disciplines. One is the linear narrative design. That's um, what we learn about character, storytelling, and dialogue from books, TV shows, and movies. But you have to merge that with what we learn about from interactive design, what we get from uh, games and mobile web app design, things where we learn about creativity, engagement, and retention. So we need to bring those things together. So let's talk about how we do that here. Uh, we looked at all of our assistant apps, and we found out the element that they had in common, the ones that were, got the most retention, is they had a really strong persona. And so we wanted to build that for our app. So uh, what we did is we actually thought about you, what, what would you might want out of the app. We benefited from having a marketing team that we could work with, but you don't need a marketing team, and really sat down and understood the brand attributes and the design principles. And from that, we distilled the style guide. And this style guide helped us write the dialogue for our assistant app. There are actually several of us writing dialogue. And by actually having a guide like this, I mean, we li I literally had a version of this that we kept up while we were writing dialogue. It kept the persona tight and crisp, even though different people were writing. So just to tell you, we also wanted to launch for the phone. Uh, so we, needed, we knew we wanted both visual and eyes-free experience. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we had the similar content, so one assistant, but similar content. So the chat bubbles are a subset of the spoken text. Uh, and that's because we could use suggestion chips, which we just fell in love with as an easy way to navigate through your, your assistant app. 
Uh, users didn't have to guess at what our app could do. We could put the most prominent things there and users could zip through very quickly. We also found that a visual description, uh, even in a very data-heavy app like this, a visual description really helped brought, bring more life. So wow, that was a whirlwind tour of design for conversational apps. There's way more to be said about it. I hope you'll take an opportunity to drill into more of the sessions here at I.O. about that or catch them on YouTube after. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to Adam, who's going to talk about actually building these things. Adam. Thanks, Brad. So I work on uh, Google's GTAC team, and our mission is actually to help developers and partners like you launch on the Assistant. So I couldn't be more excited to be here today uh, to show some of these awesome new features that we're launching and hopefully motivate you to go try it out yourself. So a couple slides back, Brad showed some really cool screenshots of uh, this Assistant app for Google I.O. that let you reserve a seat and sign in. And today I'm actually going to try to build it uh, with you right now. So let's look at some of the steps that we took to do that and that you could try yourself. So first, we create a project on the Actions console. And this is kind of like the home for the Assistant app. We then connect a natural language tool like API.ai. Now, we really like API.ai. It's a world-class natural language understanding tool. But if you have your own natural language understanding tool that's you know, best in class, you can also connect that right to our APIs. Uh, we then connect a webhook, which allows us to perform back-end processing, business logic, and connect to APIs. Uh, again, we like Node.js, but you can use any web server. Once you have all these kind of basic integration points set up, you need to test it out. So we provide a web simulator, which makes it really easy to do local development. Uh, but it's really important to always actually test on a real device. So just by clicking Test in the Actions console, you can immediately try it out on your Google Home, or your Android, or, or iPhone. So once we have all that done, we want to enhance it for mobile using some of the visual responses that Brad talked about. So we can do that with API.ai and with our webhook. And then finally, we enable that seamless sign-in flow and the ordering experience by integrating with the Transactions API. But wait a minute. So once we've gotten all this done, how does it actually happen that a user can say something to the assistant and it triggers your app and, and, all, and all the magic happens? Well, let's take a look into that. So what happens is the user says something like, talk to Google I.O. 17 to their assistant-enabled device like Google Home. And the speech is streamed through to the assistant and transcribed as text. The assistant then applies natural language understanding, ranking, it uses our knowledge graph, and it uses the user's context to understand the user's query and realize that the I.O. app is the right service to fulfill that request. So it invokes the I.O. app's API.ai agent, and the API.ai agent uh, understands it against an intent defined there that you've defined. It then calls the webhook to perform business logic to talk to the I.O. API and, and get some, some data and formulates a conversational response, which is sent all the way back through to API.ai to the assistant and out to the user. Cool. So that's how it works. And uh, let's get into some of the details of how we build it. So we mentioned that the Actions Console is kind of like the starting point. And we're really excited about this. We launched it yesterday. Uh, and it's a really focused way to kind of develop and manage your assistant app. So the three main things that it does is, one, allowing you to configure and set up the, the metadata and the directory listing for your assistant app and you know, branding information. It then allows you to manage the testing and deployment process in a fine-grained way. And then once live, it gives you analytics so that you can track you know, how it's doing out in the real world with real users. Then we connect it to API.ai or another natural language tool. So, uh, in API.ai, the, the kind of main thing that we do is we define intents and entities. So intents uh, basically model user queries so that we can understand in a structured way what the user wants. I entities are sort of structured packets of text that let us extract meaning from the user's request. So once we've gotten these defined, we can then write responses to user requests in line in the API.ai tool. And so, now that we have our kind of basic model set up, we can use training in API.ai to improve the dialogue model over time. So the example here is for the Google I.O. app. You know, if the user were to say, what Android sessions are there, API.ai is going to understand that that maps to the list session intent. And it's going to send a request down to the webhook and trigger the list session function there. So let's look at the webhook. 
Now, again, you can build a webhook using any web server framework, uh, but a, we like Node.js, and we like it so much, we built a client library that makes it easier to, to interact with. So you can get that just with one command, npm install actions on Google. And basically, we have a bit of boilerplate, and we have a handler for this list session intent, list topics intent. And you can see there, all we're doing is we're calling the Google I.O. API, getting a structured uh, set of categories, and then formulating a conversational response. The topics covered are dot, dot, dot. Now that all this stuff is set up, again, we want to test it out. So we have this web simulator, and it's newly updated to provide an interface for testing things visually and for testing a, a voice-only environment. And again, it's super important to actually test on device. So just by clicking Test in Actions Console, you can immediately take your device and say, talk to my app, and you're going to be able to test it out just like that. OK, so I'm going to go over to my uh, Demo 1 machine, and uh, we're going to actually try this out with the real I.O. app. So this is the Actions Console, and we can see it's already set up with uh, the I.O. demo app. We've got some uh, app information uh, set up there, which is basically branding information. And it's already connected to an API Today project. And we can go edit on API Today right now. And we have some intents already set up. We have a welcome intent, which handles the case where the user triggers the app. We have the choose session intent, uh, which lets the user get details about a session and a couple others. So I've been around I.O. yesterday, and I heard some uh, developers wondering what the free stuff was this year. So why don't we make this app a little bit more useful and make it so that the user could just say to their phone anytime, hey, what's the swag at I.O., and get a useful response? So to do that, we would just create a intent. And we can call it the swag intent and add a query. What's the swag at I.O.? And right there in the tool, we can define a response. It's a Google Home and $700 in cloud credits. Awesome. And so we just hit Save. We go to the Actions on Google integration. And we click Test. And just like that, we can try this out in, in our web simulator. So we say, talk to IO demo. And we have to log in. It invokes this, this app, and we can say, what's the swag at I.O.? And it's a Google Home and 700 in cloud credits. Awesome. So now that we have kind of some of the basic wiring set up, um, we can talk about making this work really nicely on mobile. So back here. Um, so to make it work really nicely on mobile, we want to add visual responses with API Today and with our webhook. So API Today provides a built-in uh, card building interface. And this is really nice. It lets us easily define cards and chips and carousels and lists. It also can then send that request down to the webhook which will enable uh, you to create dynamic responses. So that's a really nice, uh, useful feature we've, we've added. Let's look at how we do it from the webhook. So there's two really important things in, in this code that you see. The first one is that we're checking whether the user has a screen. So this is super important because we need to be aware of the user's modality, of their context, and tailor our experience accordingly. So if the user has a screen, we show a rich card that's populated with data about the session. OK, so now I can head back over to the machine and show adding that right into the I.O. app. Looks like there's a delay. Uh, so heading back over to the demo one machine. Great. OK, so we have this session that ha the, this intent that handles the, the moment when the user has asked for information, specific information about a, a session. So this is the choose session intent. And what we can do is add suggestion chips right there with the API Today response builder. So we add some suggestion chips, and we'll add that reserve a seat chip. And we can add some others like you know next session, other topics and hit Save. 
Now to add that rich card that's dynamically populated, we need to turn over to the webhook and, and update it. So this is the webhook code. And right here we have essentially like a controller for our app. So it has you know, a pointer to each of the intents in API.ai that triggers a function in the Node.js code. So the choose session intent is here. And we can see that right now it's just doing a very simple thing. It's calling the IO API, and it's creating a, a you know, simple text response. So we have that code that we showed before prepared here, and we can add it in. And we're checking the, whether there's screen output, whether the user has a screen. And if they do, then we add a, a, this rich, rich response. Otherwise, we can fall back on this text response. OK, and my webhook will automatically update. And I can go and update and test. So now we're heading back to the simulator. And let's say I'm interested in the what's new in Android session. So I'll get this rich card with a link and with the suggestion chips. So that was pretty easy, right? OK, so the last part then, uh, heading back into the, into the deck, is to add this transactional experience where the user can sign in and they can actually make an order. So we are so excited about the Transactions API. It released for a developer preview yesterday, so you can start building with it now. And really what it does is it lets you accept purchases and orders from your users with your app. And we make this a great experience on the Assistant with three main things. The first is providing a seamless build-in experience for sharing payments and identity information between the user and the app. Once the user has sort of gotten this information and approved the purchase, we then give you a way to re-engage, because you've now sent the user a receipt, and we can send updates to that receipt that manifest as notifications for the user. So you can actually re-engage and get the user back into your app in that way. Now, to integrate with the Transactions API, there are five main steps. So first, building out a basket or a shopping cart. And this can be as simple as uh, you know, a suggestion chip, like in the IO app, or it can be as complicated as a, a menu ordering experience you know, with lots of different choices and customizations. During that cart assembly process, you might need some more information about the user. You might need to know what's their delivery address. This lets you set price and service availability, et cetera. So we give you an API to request that. Once your order is all set up, you need to propose it to the user and get their authorization. So we provide a propose order API that lets the user preview what, they're, what you're asking them to buy and approve it. Once they've approved it, you need to confirm the order. So let them know that it's active and send them a receipt. So we provide a confirm order API for that. So lastly, many transactional experiences require the user's identity. And so we provide uh, the ability to integrate with an OAuth 2 web server and provide a seamless login flow for the user. So let's take a deeper look into that. Uh, so you know, many of you uh, hopefully are familiar with OAuth 2. It's pretty, pretty standard. And basically, to set it up with Actions on Google, you go to the Actions console, and you configure the usual OAuth 2 stuff, uh, client ID, client secret, auth URL, et cetera, there. And that lets us know how to talk to your server. And then in dialog, you call an API to trigger the sign-in flow. So you can do that from API.ai or, or from the webhook. Now, once the user is signed in, you want to propose the order. So this snippet of code shows a propose order API call. And uh, what we're doing here is we're building a structured order object. We're populating the line item with the session title. We're saying, hey, the price is zero. And then we're calling the ask for transaction decision uh, API to, to propose the order. Once the order has been proposed, we get a new request saying, hey, the user accepted the order. Now you need to confirm it. So this snippet of code shows confirming the order. And here we're building a structured order update. Uh, we say, hey, the status is confirmed. We provide a receipt. And then we send it along to the user as a receipt, just like any other visual response. OK. One more time going back to the machine, and we're going to actually add all this into our app. So where we left off is we had this suggestion chip reserve a C, but we don't have any way to handle it. So we need a new intent to handle the case where the user taps that chip. So we can create the reserve a seat intent, and it'll be triggered when the user says reserve a seat. And then what we want to do is immediately call the sign in API. So there's just a, a little bit of code that we need to put into API.ai to, to trigger that. And we can just add it here and hit Save. 
So with that, we're calling the sign-in API, which will log in the user. Now, to make this really work, again, we need to hook up our OAuth2 uh, server to the project. So going back into the console, we can see how we did that. So we have this account linking section. And we can edit it. And you know, we see that it's pre-filled, but we have the standard stuff, client ID, client secret. There's a couple extra steps that we take to, in our OAuth2 server to make the integration really seamless. And it, it's easy to do. And, it, and you know, we highly recommend everyone does it. OK, so what do we have? We have an intent to handle when the user says reserve a seat. We trigger the sign in API. But what happens when the user signs in? Well, we have this intent set up that basically passes that event through to our webhook. And what we're going to do then is call the propose order API. Once the order is proposed and the user accepts it, we get another request to API.ai saying, hey, the user accepted this. You need to confirm the order. And that comes through and is matched by the handle order intent here. That, that's again, is just passed right through to the webhook, which calls the confirm order API. And then we're done. So the last thing to do is just add this code into our webhook. So going back in, we see we have the uh, controller for our app, and we have the handle sign-in and handle uh, order handlers. And we see that they're empty right now. So we can add in that code. So handle sign in, again, this should look familiar. We're building an order object, populating it with session data, and you know, proposing it to the user with this call right here. For handle decision, this is where the user has already accepted the order, and we want to provide a receipt. So we can add that code, and it should automatically update. So that's it. That's all it took. And now we can actually test this out on my demo2 device. Just have to update the project. Cool. So we're just going to go over to the demo2 device. And we can say IO demo. What's new in Android? We can tap the reserve a seat chip. OK, well, that's why it's a developer preview. Uh, we can do one thing, and I think it'll make it work. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. So I think it'll work if I can just do this. Might have been user error. OK, so let's try it one more time. IO demo. What's new in Android? Hmm. There we go. Cool. And we see with just two taps, I'm creating an account on this server. And we propose the order to the user. What's new in Android? Zero dollars. I approve. And we get our receipt. Cool. So that's all it took. We did that in like 10 minutes. We built a transactional experience, seamlessly signed in the user. It's pretty awesome stuff. So let me uh, jump back in for just a quick recap on, on what we did. So we created a rich mobile experience for finding out about IO sessions. We added a suggestion chip to let the user reserve a seat. And we connected an OAuth2 server to enable a seamless sign-in flow. And finally, we used the Transactions API to propose the reservation and get the user's acceptance and send a receipt. And we did this again in like 10 minutes. So I, really, I believe that all of you could go right now and, and, add it and build apps yourselves that do the same exact thing. And I'm so excited to see what you do. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Vera. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thanks, Adam. I'm Vera, and I'm here to tell you how your app can be discovered once you build. I have the opportunity to talk to partners like you every day, and this is one of the primary things that we hear. Let's actually start by admitting that we live in a pretty amazing time in technology. People are asking computers to do things for them. They're asking them to help them plan their day, to get from one place to another, and to even clean their apartment in a mess. 
And they're asking for the little things, like my little brother, despite being 22, recently asked the Google Assistant how to make scrambled eggs for our family. And so we know that um, if you're building a productivity app or a recipe app or a smart home app, your users are out there looking for you. And if there's one thing that we've learned about discovery over the years, it's that the best way to find users who want your service is for them to find you. And think about it. This is actually a very different world. Uh, no longer does the user have to know that your app exists or have to download it or even have to set it up. All they have to do is say, OK, Google, or long press on home on their mobile device, and they have access to your service. And that's on over 100 million plus devices. And I'll be honest, we're still getting started. There's a ton of work to do, but that's a pretty exciting thing. Our goal at Google is to help connect you to your users. So today, we're starting with three primary ways of enabling discovery of your Assistant app through the Google Assistant. The first is in dialog, so directly in the conversation with the user. The second is through the Assistant directory, which we announced yesterday. And then the third is through links that you can share. So let's actually start with in dialog, so directly in the conversation with the user. The most reliable way that a user can get to your Assistant app is by explicitly asking for it, meaning we have a set of uh, pre-established phrases, things like talk to, speak to, ask, or at, that once said, with the name of your Assistant app, we introduce you, and then you own the dialogue end to end. A user can also deep link directly to an answer. So to extend the demo that Adam just did, a user can say, hey, Google, let's talk to Google I.O. 17. And then we introduce the app. And they can also say something like, hey, Google, ask Google I.O. 17 about what was announced. And we'll introduce the app and then take the user directly to the answer. So some partner examples of this are hey, let's speak to Domino's, and then we introduce Domino's, and then Domino's comes in. You can order a pizza. My brother might need this in case the eggs go awry. Or, hey, Google, at Akinator, and we introduce a great game on the platform. Or, hey, Google, uh, I love this app, ask Dr. Doggy if dogs can eat chocolate, and we introduce Dr. Doggy for what could be an urgent question. The way to think about explicit triggering is very similar to typing a URL in a, uh, and getting to a website, or tapping on an app icon and then going inside the app. The next way to introduce uh, your Assistant app in dialog is through implicit triggering. So I'm really excited about this one, because this actually starts showing the promise of the platform. We know that users are asking the Google Assistant a whole set of things. They're asking, hey, tell me a joke, or I want to play a game, or I want to work out. And we at Google look at all the apps that can fulfill on that and suggest some to the user. So this already works today. You can say, hey, Google, I want to work out. And we introduce FitStar, which has a great guided workout. Um, it's super easy to be able to do this. Um, all you have to do is add an invocation grammar to your app in API.ai or whatever natural language solution they use. So I want to show you what that looks like, because it's super easy. Uh, if we go to the demo one device. Maybe. Can we go to the demo one device, the computer, please? Maybe. <laughs> if not, maybe we'll pause for a second. I can tell you. Oh, here we go. Awesome. So uh, we're here in the intent, the swag intent that Adam already created. And you can see his what's the swag at I.O. Let's say you want to add something a little bit more colloquial, like what's the freebie at I.O.? Type it in. You can scroll down. The answer is still the same. You guys got a home in 700 in cloud credits. That's awesome. Make sure the, and the conversation, you hit save. And that's really it. And you're able to test it by going into integrations, actions on Google. You make sure you select the swag intent here. And then once you hit test, that's it. 
So let's actually go to the demo two device and try it out. So in this case, um, Adam, what is your what is your password? <laughs> what is it? You're locked in. What is do you want to actually unlock it so we can test it? If, um, we can do the test later. But basically what happens is you say, what's the freebie at I.O.? And then we introduce the Google I.O. 17 app. Let's say you've never heard of it before. That's pretty cool. I didn't know there was an assistant app that is about Google I.O. And then um, the Google I.O. 17 app is able to say, your freebie at I.O. is the Google Home and $700 in uh, app credits. Awesome. We can go back to the slides. Um, one of the primary questions that we get about implicit triggering is, how are you guys going to rank? Um, we're going to be looking at a ton of different signals, and it's still very early. Uh, and we'll iterate on this significantly over time. But one of the primary things we're going to look at is the quality of your app, as well as things like uh, the user's context or their preferences. And again, we'll experiment significantly over time. The next way for you to grow discovery of your Assistant app is through the Assistant directory. So we launched this with the goal of letting a user try out new apps, browse apps, as well as set the preferences for their personal assistant. The way that a user gets to the Assistant directory on Android is by long pressing on Home and then tapping the upper right-hand corner icon. Uh, on iOS, they get there by going to the Assistant app, and then same thing, tapping on the upper right-hand corner icon. And there's also a web link for the directory. So once the user in, is in the directory, they can scroll different categories. They can tap on an app. They can try the app directly there. They can rate the app. Uh, and then they can also set their own personal preferences with the app. So we have this concept of voice shortcuts. Uh, this is where a user can go directly to, to your assistant app. So I have mine set as, hey, Google, it's chill out time. And then Netflix starts playing on my Chromecast. And then I have another one, which I love, which is, hey, Google, it's party time. And then my Philips Hue bulbs turn on. And then uh, can't touch this starts playing on my Google Home device on Spotify, which is pretty awesome. Um, the way that you can improve visibility of your app within the directory is by one, again, keep the quality of your app really, really high. This is what's going to help with both ranking and with reviews. And then two, submit rich images, well-written descriptions. This is what's going to encourage a user to try out your app directly in the directory and then re-engage with it again in the future. Cool. The third way of growing discovery of your assistant app is through links that you can share. So you have a role here, too. You have the ability to promote and grow awareness of your assistant app. We encourage you to do this by doing things like, one, share through social media. Encourage your users to take this viral. Two, promote through your own owned and operated properties. So link to your sites or to your Android or iOS apps. Encourage users to use your service across different platforms. And then three, encourage press to drive traffic to your assistant app. Allow other sites to link to it. Enable awareness that way. So uh, let's go to uh, device three, and I can show you what that looks like as well. Demo three, please. OK, awesome. So as I mentioned, you get to the assistant directory by long pressing on home. You tap on the upper right-hand corner. This is what the directory looks like. And we scroll down to education and reference. Talk to Google I.O. This is the landing page within the directory. You can hit share. And let's actually tweet it. And this is live, which is awesome. We can say, woo, we're live at I.O. And actually tweet it. Cool. Once a user taps on that link, they go to, uh, directly to your landing page within the directory. Awesome. Go back to the slides, please. So as a recap, the way that you can grow discovery of your assistant app is, one, uh, in dialogue, so directly in the conversation with the user, both implicitly and explicitly. 
two through the assistant directory, and then three through links that you share. So we know if you're building a recipe app that helps you cook breakfast for your family, or a, a fitness app that helps someone uh, keep their routine, your users are out there looking for you. And our goal at Google is to help connect you to your users. And with that, I'll hand it back to Brad to wrap up. Awesome. Thank you. We've shown you a ton of stuff today, building conversational experience for eyes free on the phone, doing transactions, and getting your app discovered. Uh, you're now ready to participate in our, our app development challenges. Uh, tons of great prizes. I encourage you to do that. Uh, but let's keep this conversation going. Uh, we're going to be at the assistant booth, uh, which is kind of in the main area on the walkway there. Come by and talk to us with more questions, ton of other talks. And just a special thanks to Sachit, who uh, built the assistant app that we see here today. So again, thank you very much. games all my life. It's my passion. I also learned how to program computers. And then in 2001, we start the first video games company for mobile phones in Spain called Microjocs. In 2013, my studio was acquired by a big company. Some of the guys and myself, we decided that we should do something fresh, something new. And we founded Only Run. Titan Roll is a real-time strategy game. It's uh, considered as a MOBA. MOBA is a massive online battle arena but especially designed for mobile devices. The game is today as it is thanks to the Early Access program. We changed many things from the learnings from the community. Since we launched the game on Early Access, we got more than 2 million installs on Android devices. We started in the Early Access program back at the very beginning of it. The difference between the Early Access program and a traditional soft launch is that users are actively giving the team feedback. So you don't only check the metrics you have, but they also provide possible solutions. So you end up by doing the game players want to play. The thing about not having the ratings, but do having the constructive feedback was very good. The Early Access was a great opportunity for an indie developer, someone starting, and very key for us in Omnitron. When we started with the Early Access program, we approached it in different stages. So the idea was at the beginning to focus on the engagement of the games. Once we sorted that out, we focus on the retention of the game. And finally, we focus on monetization to do a valid product for the market. We managed with the Early Access to improve our retention in a 41%, the engagement by a 50%, and the monetization by a 20%. From the very beginning of the program till worldwide launch the game. I feel very happy working on the video games industry because it has been my passion since I was a child. And it's really inspiring that through Omnidron, we have a real chance to shape the new era of the video game. In response to popular demand, the Android Framework team has written an opinionated guide to architecting Android apps, and they've developed a companion set of architecture components. Hi, my name's Lila, a developer advocate for Android, and I'm here to introduce you to these shiny new architecture components. These components persist data, manage lifecycle, make your app modular, help you avoid memory leaks, and prevent you from having to write boring boilerplate code. Your basic Android app needs a database connected to a robust UI. The new components, Room, View Model, Live Data, and Lifecycle make that easy. They're also designed to fit together like building blocks. So let's see how. 
I'll tackle the database using Room, which is a new SQLite object mapping library. To set up the tables using Room, we can define a plain old Java object, or POJO. We then mark this POJO with the at entity annotation and create an ID marked with the at primary key annotation. Now for each POJO, you need to define a DAO or database access object. The annotated methods represent the SQL-like commands you need to interact with your POJO's data. Now take a look at this insert method and this query method. Room has automatically converted your POJO objects into the corresponding database tables and back again. Room also verifies your SQLite at compile time. So if you spell something a little bit wrong, or if you reference a column that's not actually in the database, it will throw a helpful error. Now that you have a Room database, you can use another new architecture component called Live Data to monitor changes in the database. Live Data is an observable data holder. That means it holds data and notifies you when the data changes so that you can update the UI. Live Data is an abstract class that you can extend. Or for simple cases, you can use the mutable live data class. If you update the value of the mutable live data with a call to set value, it can then trigger an update in your UI. What's even more powerful though, is that Room is built to support live data. To use them together, you just modify your DAO to return objects that are wrapped with the live data class. Room will create a live data object observing the database. Then you could write code like this to update your UI. The end result is that if your Room database updates, it changes the data in your live data object, which automatically triggers UI updates. This brings me to another awesome feature of live data. Live data is a lifecycle aware component. Now you might be thinking, what exactly is a lifecycle aware component? Well, I'm glad you asked. Through the magic of lifecycle observation, live data knows when your activity is on screen, off screen, or destroyed so that it doesn't send database updates to a non-active UI. There are two interfaces for this, lifecycle owner and lifecycle observer. Lifecycle owners are objects with life cycles, like activities and fragments. Lifecycle observers, on the other hand, observe lifecycle owners and are notified of lifecycle changes. Here's a quick peek at the simplified code for live data, which is also a lifecycle observer. The methods annotated with at on lifecycle event take care of initialization and teardown when the associated lifecycle owner starts and stops. This allows live data objects to take care of their own setup and teardown. So the UI components observe the live data and the live data components observe the lifecycle owners. As a side note to all you Android library designers out there, you can use this exact same lifecycle observation code to call setup and teardown functions automatically for your own libraries. Now you still have one more problem to solve. As your app is used, it will go through various configuration changes that destroy and rebuild the activity. We don't want to tie the initialization of live data to the activity lifecycle because that causes a lot of needlessly re-executed code. An example of this is your database query, which is executed every time you rotate the phone. So what do you do? Well, you put your live data and any other data associated with the UI in a view model instead. View models are objects that provide data for UI components and survive configuration changes. To create a view model object, you extend the view model class. You then put all of the necessary data for your activity UI into the view model. Since you've cached data for the UI inside of the view model, your app won't require the database if your activity is recreated due to a configuration change. Then when you're creating your activity or fragment, you can get a reference to the view model and use it. And that's it. The first time you get a view model, it's generated for your activity. When you request a view model again, your activity receives the original view model with the UI data cached. So there's no more useless database calls. To summarize all of this new architecture shininess, we've talked about Room, which is an object mapping library for SQLite, Live Data, which notifies you when its data changes so that you can update the UI, and importantly, it works well with Room so that you can easily update the UI when the database values change. We've also talked about lifecycle observers and owners, which allow non-UI objects to observe lifecycle events. And finally, we've talked about view models, which provide you data objects that survive configuration changes. Altogether, they make up a set of architecture components for writing modular, testable, and robust Android apps. You can sensibly use them together, or you can pick and choose what you need. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, a more fully fledged Android app might look like this. For an in-depth look at how everything works together and the reasoning behind these components, check out the links in the description below. To jump straight into code and get started working with these objects, you can check out the code labs and samples for lifecycle and persistence. Happy building, and as always, don't forget to subscribe. I'm Wojtek Kaliczyński, this is Android Tool Time, and let's talk a bit about the Espresso Test Recorder 
and how it can help with adding UI tests to your app. But first, a short explanation for those unfamiliar with Espresso. Espresso is a testing framework designed to provide a fluent API for writing concise and reliable UI tests. However, it is often the case that developers are reluctant to add UI tests to their apps or simply don't have time to learn the framework. This is where the Espresso test recorder comes in. It lets you create and add UI tests to an existing app in an interactive way. You may have previously seen the beta version of this feature, but in Android Studio 2.3, we are promoting it to stable with a few enhancements. To get started with the test recorder, click on Record Espresso Test under the Run menu. The Device Selection dialog pops up, and after you make your choice, the test recorder runs your app in debug mode. Simply progress through your app's UI as a regular user would by clicking buttons, swiping, and typing into input fields, and the, all those actions will appear in the test recorder window. You can also click here to add an assertion to your test at any time during recording, which will trigger the test recorder to dump the current view hierarchy. To select the view you want to assert on, click on the screenshot that appears in the recorder window and choose between the assertion type from view exists, doesn't exist, or check that it contains the specified text. When you've finished recording your test, the test recorder generates the equivalent test code to run your actions and assertions and puts it in a new file in your project's instrumentation test folder. It also checks if your build file contains the required Espresso dependencies and adds those if needed. When you look at the source file that Espresso test recorder created, you will see that it's perfectly normal, human-readable code. So if you need to further customize your tests or alter them when your app changes, you can simply open the file again and make the alterations you need. As you can see, the Espresso test recorder is very simple to use but it does come with some limitations. As of Android Studio 2.3, only a few most common assertions are available through the recorder UI. So if you need anything more complicated than that, you will need to edit the generated code by hand. Also, at this stage, the test recorder cannot handle all situations where additional synchronization is needed to deal with delays and async operations in your apps. I highly recommend getting familiar with the Espresso idling resource API and using that in your tests to signal when a long-running operation happens. For advanced users who want to tweak some aspects of test code generation, there's a settings page for the test recorder in Android Studio Preferences. Here, you can change the maximum view hierarchy depth that will be used for view identification and if app data should be cleared every time you record a new test. The Espresso test recorder is a great way to start adding tests to your app whether you want to learn Espresso by examining the generated code, or simply to quickly build a test suite, which you can customize later. We look forward to your feedback on our social channels, and happy testing. There are approximately 285 million people with visual impairments around the world. Making your app accessible not just opens it up to these users, but it has a potential to improve design for everyone. Most people are familiar with an accessibility service called TalkBack, which is a screen reader utility for people who are blind and visually impaired. With TalkBack, the user performs input via gestures such as swiping or dragging, or an external keyboard. The output is usually spoken feedback. There are two gesture input modes. The first one is touch exploration, where you drag your finger across the screen. And the second one 
is linear navigation, where you swipe left and right with your finger until you find the item of interest. Once you arrive to the item you're interested in, you double tap on it to activate. The primary way in which you can attach alternative text description for your UI elements to be spoken by TalkBack is by using an Android attribute called Content Description. If you don't provide Content Description for an image button, for example, the experience for a TalkBack user can be jarring. Unlabeled button. Double tap to activate. Unlabeled button. Double tap to activate. For decorative elements such as spacers and dividers, setting Content Description to Null will tell TalkBack to ignore and not speak these elements. Make sure to not include control type or control state in your content description. Words like buttons, selected, checked, etc. as Android natively does that for you. Android Lint automatically show you which UI controls lack content descriptions. To keep TalkBack spoken output tidy, you can arrange related content into groups by using focusable containers. When TalkBack encounters such a container, it will present the content as a single announcement. For more complex structures such as tables, you can assign focus to a container holding one piece of the structure, such as a single row. Grouping content both reduces the amount of swiping the user has to do while streamlining speech output. Here is an example of how ungrouped table content works. Song details. Name. Hey Jude. Artists. The Beatles. Cost. $1.45. And here's the same content with grouping applied. Content grouping activity. Song details. Name, Hey Jude, Artists, The Beatles, Cost, $1.45. You should manually test your app with TalkBack and Eyes Closed to understand how a blind user may experience it. We also provide Accessibility Scanner as an app in Google Play. It suggests accessibility improvements automatically by looking at content labels, clickable items, contrast, and more. Vision impairments doesn't just refer to blindness. 65% of our population is farsighted, for example. With careful design, you can make sure that many of your visually impaired users can have a positive experience without having to rely on talkback. Begin by making sure that UI of your apps works with other accessibility settings, including increased font size and magnification. Keep your touch targets large, at least 48 by 48 dp. This makes them easier to distinguish and touch. Provide adequate color contrast. The World Wide Web Consortium created color contrast accessibility guidelines to help. And to assist users with color deficiencies, use cues other than color to distinguish UI elements. For example, more descriptive instructional text. If you're using custom views or drawing your app window using OpenGL, you need to manually define accessibility metadata so that accessibility services can interpret your app properly. The easiest way to achieve this goal is to rely on the Explore by Touch helper class. With just a few methods, you can build a hierarchy of virtual views that are accessible to TalkBack. Making your app accessible doesn't just limit it to new users. It helps to make the world a better place, one app at a time. To read more about developing and testing your apps for users with visual impairments, check out the links below. Also, check out the video on developing for users with motor impairments.
Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. I, uh, I like the people in the second section getting an update on VR and AR and a good suntan at the same time. That's cool. Good, good job. Um, so uh, hopefully you caught the news yesterday uh, in the main keynote. Great momentum with apps on Daydream, more Daydream-ready phones on the way, standalone VR headsets with inside-out positional tracking, uh, a super precise indoor location service we call VPS, uh, and then an update to Expeditions that we're really excited about. So I'm going to be brief here, and in a minute we'll turn it over to the people on our team who are actually leading many of the projects you're going to hear about today. But before I do that, I wanted to put what we're doing in VR and AR at Google in context, kind of put some of the puzzle pieces together for you so that you can better understand why we're doing what we're doing, and as developers, what you can expect from us. So if you've followed what we've been up to over the past several years, you've seen a bunch of different pieces, uh, Cardboard, Daydream, Tango, Jump, uh, VR apps like Earth and Tilt Brush. We're working in VR. We're doing some work in AR. Like, what's going on here? How do, you, how do you think about this? So first of all, terminology. Over the past year especially, I've seen so many debates about VR versus AR, which is going to win, like what vocab to use. And to us, these terms don't represent two separate and distinct things. They're just labels for different points on a spectrum. And for lack of a better name, we call that the spectrum of immersive computing. Kind of fully immersive is at the right. That's where everything's computer generated. That's virtual reality. And uh, real reality, like this, is at the left end of the spectrum. Uh, and AR and whatever other terms you want to use are somewhere in the middle. What's important to us is not the specific labels, uh, but it's this whole spectrum. And we're doing work across it. But why? Why invest in this? Why is it important? Well, VR, AR, immersive computing, these technologies matter because they enable us to experience computing more like we experience the real world. They enable computing to work more like we do. And we think that's a big idea. We think that's really important because every time computers have started to work, like more, work more like we do, good things have happened. If you think about moving from punch cards to the command line to the GUI to touch screens, with every progression, we became more able, more capable with our computers. And we think VR and AR will push this even further. They open up access to an entirely new kind of information, kind of experiential information, or information that's anchored physically to the real world. And we think this progression is going to be powerful. And in time, it's going to change how we work and play and live and learn. And we want to help push this forward in two ways. So first, platforms. Just as Chrome made the web faster, more secure, more powerful, and as Android made mobile computing more widely available, we hope that platforms like Daydream can push forward VR and other te technologies. And our goal here is really to raise all boats by doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the core system software, device standards, reference hardware, and SDKs. And the second part is building blocks. And by these, I mean the enabling technologies like Tango, WebVR, our Jump VR video capture system, code samples, and more. And we also think of the apps we've built, like Tilt Brush or Earth VR or Expeditions, as building blocks in that they're kind of early examples of VR apps to look at and to learn from. So this morning is about exactly these two things, platforms and building blocks. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Johnny Lee, the founder of the Tango Project, to talk about one of our most important building blocks. Thanks. Howdy, howdy. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Johnny Lee. I'm the engineering director of Tango. In 2013, a small group of us uh, got together with the belief that one day our devices would be able to sense 3D motion and space just like we can. And so with the right combination of hardware and software, Tango can give our devices this 3D sense of motion sensing capabilities, as well as the ability to recognize places it's been before. And so this establishes a, a shared space, a shared sense of space and physical movement between people and our devices, and allowed us to begin creating experiences that uh, gave us an early glimpse into how we could interact with digital content in a physical way. 
Today, four years later, we're starting to see a new genre of products in both AR and VR that put 3D tracking, uh, uh, sense, 3D tracking and sensing as a fundamental part of the user experience. And so Tango is involved into an enabling technology that's uh, do it, powering everything we're doing within Daydream. Yesterday, you heard Clay talk about our support for standalone VR headsets. And by building all the hardware into the headset and taking advantage of years of optimization work with Qualcomm uh, uh, mobile processors, low-cost tracking sensors, we can enable a headset that responds to the movement of the user's head, similar to desktop VR systems we see today, but without all the cables and setup. And we call this technology WorldSense. And it's a version of Tango that we've been working on specifically for VR. So let me show you a little bit about how it works in a headset. There's two wide-angle cameras that detect the movement of features in the room. And these features might be things like the corners of a desk, uh, items on the table, or texture on the floor. And it tracks the movement of these features over time to get a sense of its position in the room. We then tightly couple this visual motion information with the motion sensors on the phone to provide robust low-latency positional tracking. And we give this information to games and applications all in less than five milliseconds achieving an overall display latency of around 20 milliseconds. At the same time, the system is building a coarse 3D model of the scene, uh, recognizing features that's seen before, so it can correct any drift that may occur over time. Uh, you may have heard this referred to as SLAM, or Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. So that's a high-level review of what WorldSense is, and eliminates one of the major differences between desktop and mobile VR today. Now, in smartphone AR, uh, AR applications require sensing even more of the environment uh, to be able to place digital objects in front of us accurately enough to seem as though they physically exist. And today, today, Tango phones use additional sensors to enable a richer set of augmented reality experiences than's possible with a standard phone. We have a dedicated depth sensor that allows games to understand the difference between the floor, the table, and the walls and even lets characters hide behind things like couches. We have a wide-angle camera track for tracking that give us the best view of the features in the room, uh, allowing very robust positional tracking in the phone. And this and also improves our ability to quickly relocalize so we can recognize where we are in the room, letting you see AR content that was set there before or even left by other people. And so to give you an example of the kind of experiences that you can do with all this technology put together, I wanted to share you, you, with you this project that we've been doing with the uh, Singapore Art Science Museum. You have audio for the video? Most people living in cities have never been to a rainforest. Ah, no audio so for we the decided video. to oh, bring a rainforest to a city and make it accessible for everyone. For that, we needed a new Google technology. We were able to map 10,000 square feet of a museum space into a rainforest. Visitors experience what it's like to walk through a rainforest, learned about endangered animals threatened by deforestation, and were tasked to plant a virtual tree. We were able to launch this experience on the first Tango-enabled device, the Lenovo Fab2 Pro, and bring AR at scale to everyone, making Into the Wild the largest AR experience in the world. So sorry about missing the, oh, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, so the exhibit actually allows thousands of visitors to come and experience a digital rainforest in it. And when they pledge a donation to the World Wildlife Fund, they actually are allowed to plant a tree. And other visitors can see that tree grow in the museum. And the rainforest starts to expand over time as visitors uh, see the exhibit. We're still in the early days of seeing how these experiences will evolve. Uh, so let me just, this is just a glimpse into what's possible today. The first phone featuring Tango enabled capabilities was the Lenovo Fab2 Pro, which had shelves last fall. Our second phone is the Zenfone AR from Asus. And I'm really glad to announce that customers will be able to experience the Zenfone in Verizon stores across the United States uh, later this summer. And over the next year, you'll see us bring Tango functionality to many, many more phones. And we really just believe this is be the beginning. We've seen a variety of great applications begin to appear that take advantage of these new, new capabilities. For example, we have tools that can help you measure the size of the table 
uh, in case you're interested in buying one for your dining room. Uh, or you can do things like walk around your house uh, with the tracking sensors and the, motion and the depth sensor to generate a heat map of the Wi-Fi wi wi signal strength within your apartment or in the building. And this actually lets you help find, you, help, help find dead spots or where you might want to put the router or even buy a repeater. Uh, you can even use a, a estimate the square footage of your apartment, uh, which might actually come in handy if you're thinking about moving into a new place or even renegotiating your rent. There's games like World by Phenomena, which allow you to carry a toy box right in your pocket. And yesterday, you heard about the visual positioning service from Clay, which opens up many new experiences around indoor uh, location and navigation. With the permission of each venue, we use the wide-angle camera and the Tango phone to give us a broad view of the environment. And this allows us to generate large-scale descriptions of the space. And this enables centimeter-scale accurate positioning within the building. It's a lot like GPS, but rather than talking to satellites you know, a 1,000 miles above the Earth, uh, it's just using features that are just a few feet away to calculate its position. This is what we actually use in the Art Science Museum that allows us to anchor trees in the environment. In stores like retail, in stores like Lowe's, uh, it can get you walking directions directly to an item sitting on the shelf. So uh, even at home, we've started shopping with our phones more and more. And having confidence in what you're about to buy is more important than ever. So another area where we've seen is shopping, uh, where shopping for clothes, sorry, where shopping for clothes is really challenging. And so online retailers know that buying clothes out of the right fit are sometimes difficult, and customers often return those items. But this is expensive for the retailer to process uh, those returns, as well as difficult, uh, time consuming for you as a consumer to try on those items. So it'd be nice to get a better sense of how, whether or not a product will fit with you before you buy it. And so let me give you a demo of uh, the dressing room app by Gap. So what we have here, I have the Zenfone AR from Asus. Um, and the Gap app has a small drawer here with uh, some uh, uh, clothing options. And we're going on a trip uh, in a, just a few months, and I'm trying to wear lighter clothes for the summer time. And my brother is going on the trip as well, so I would like to have matching white cotton shirts. So I'm going to drag over this mannequin with this uh, clothing item. And it asks, uh, well, what is the body size of the person that's going to wear the clothing? So like me, my brother's a little bit at the uh, extra large end of the scale. When I put try, try it on, oops, let me try it again. Oh, it's reversed. Hold on. Let me try that again. Oh. We'll try that. We'll switch back to the video. Can you watch the video? Ah. Anyway, um, sorry about that. It was working fine just before the demo. I just uh, don't know what happened. We're still in the early days of uh, what we feel like will be possible with these technologies. And it lets us see things in new ways that we couldn't see before. Uh, so it helps us learn about more the, about the environment. It helps us find our way through spaces uh, and share knowledge with other people in a physical and visual medium. But one of the things that helps, it helps us do is learn better, especially when we are able to make connections with those who are seeing the same thing at the same time from their own unique perspective. And in this way, the power of AR isn't in just adding digital objects to the camera view in front of us, but it can be shared, uh, adding shared meaning to the interaction between people. So to tell you more about how shared IR experiences can help in the classroom, let me hand it off to Jen Holland. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Johnny. I'm Jennifer Holland, and I'm the Education Program Manager on Daydream. Johnny shared some updates about the applications of Tango as well as areas where we think AR can have a big immediate impact. Education is just one of those areas, 
And my team took advantage of Tango Sensor Stack and built a tool for schools so that teachers could create immersive experiences with their students. And that's the same technology that's actually available to all of you. Two years ago, we launched Expeditions VR. And we've built more than 600 tours, and we've heard from thousands of kids from around the world who have sent us personal letters sharing how Expeditions has inspired them. We've learned a great deal from talking to the over 2 million teachers and students who have actually used it. And one of the most important things that my team learned was that you really need to embrace the key functions of a classroom. That is, students engaging, interacting, and learning with each other, as well as their teacher. Tango's camera and sensor are what makes this interaction possible in real time. And no, I promise you, those kids are not taking selfies in their class. Teachers are able to accurately map the physical classroom and place 3D objects, like one of Michelangelo's statues, right on the students' desks so that all students can look at the statue together in real time. Students can move the Tango-enabled phone to get up close to see the detail or take a step back to get a sense of the scale and be able to point out new discoveries on the statue together. And that's powerful, because it's not each individual student looking at their own object like a whirling Category 5 hurricane. It's as if you actually brought the hurricane into the classroom. Students can view any object from a strand of DNA to one of Saturn's rings together. And those objects don't disappear when the students look away. And a teacher is able to point out specific things on the object to suit the lesson. Just think how cool it would be for a teacher to transform their entire classroom into a world-class art museum and display the works of Van Gogh, Monet, or even the Mona Lisa right on the same classroom walls. As an education product team, we're committed to leveraging the same Tango technology available to you and tweaking it slightly to give teachers a tool to create immersive experiences each and every day in their classroom. And just like we did with Expeditions VR, we're going to be bringing this tool to schools through the AR Expeditions Pioneer program. And schools can sign up if they're interested for a visit. And if you're a developer really excited about building AR lessons with us, let us know by expressing interest on our partner page. That's Expeditions AR. That is just one thing that you can do with Tango, and we're really excited to see what all of you come up with. Now, let's switch gears and talk about another part of the immersive computing spectrum. Let me welcome Mike to tell you the latest about Daydream, our platform for high-performance mobile VR. Great job. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Jazieri, and I'm the Director of Product Management for Daydream. Daydream serves as the foundation of our investments in immersive computing. We began working on Daydream in 2015 with the initial goal of bringing high-performance smartphone VR to Android. Today, I'm excited to tell you about what's next for Daydream. But first, a quick refresher on how we got here. So the first version of Daydream launched in November and was built on three core elements. The Daydream Ready spec for phones, a high-performance VR mode in Android N, and of course, the Daydream experience, including Play Store in VR. We promised to create a large ecosystem of Daydream Ready devices. And I'm very proud to say that in just six months, there are eight Daydream Ready devices on market. And as Clay announced yesterday, Samsung's flagship S8 and S8 Plus will soon be Daydream Ready, with an update coming this summer. They're fantastic phones, and you're going to love the Daydream experience on them. But that's not all. LG's next flagship phone, launching in the second half of this year, will also be Daydream Ready. In addition to these new partners, existing partners, including Motorola and Asus, will have more Daydream Ready phones. So when you put all that together, there will be tens of millions of Daydream Ready phones in consumers' hands by the end of the year. I think that's a really big deal, and I want to thank our partners uh, who've been working really hard on that. Thank you. So that's the start. Now let's talk about what's coming next. This year at Google I.O., we're announcing two major updates to Daydream. 
The first is support for a brand new category of standalone headsets. And second is a major update to the Daydream software platform. We're going to call this 2.0 release Daydream Euphrates. Let's talk about both, and let's start with headsets. So as Clay announced yesterday, the standalone headset takes everything that we love about smartphone VR and makes it even better. All you need for VR, the software, the hardware, is in one integrated device. It's much more immersive because of WorldSense. And you can get into VR in just seconds. You just put the headset on, you're ready to go. No extra wires, PCs, or setup required. Now, for these standalone headsets, we wanted to create a large ecosystem of devices and of content. And doing so requires great hardware. So we've partnered deeply with Qualcomm to create a reference standalone headset. This is featuring this powerful Snapdragon 835 chipset, custom designed tracking cameras, and high performance sensors. Now, those tracking cameras are particularly important because they enable a much more immersive VR experience with WorldSense, which Johnny just talked about. But a reference headset isn't all that we're doing. We're also partnering with two leading device makers to actually bring these headsets to market starting at the end of the year. HTC really needs no introduction uh, in the world of VR. They're already a leader in this space with the Vive headset. They're going to bring their expertise in headset design, optics, and building high-performance VR systems to Daydream. Our other partner is Lenovo. And we've worked, they've been a longtime partner of ours, and we worked together to bring this first Tango phone to market. So they're already a pioneer in AR, and they're going to bring that same pioneering spirit to Daydream. So that's standalone headsets. But powerful hardware also requires powerful software. And that's where the next version of Daydream, Daydream Euphrates, comes in. We focused on three things for this release. First is all the software support you need for standalone headsets. Second is making VR content front and center, the content that you build. And third is making it easy for users to share that VR content with friends and family, whether they're sitting right next to them or around the world. So let's talk about each one. Daydream Euphrates takes advantage of even deeper support for VR that's in Android O, in particular the capabilities needed to support standalone headsets. So if you think about it, Android phones have been designed for devices, or Android has been designed for devices that primarily run uh, touch screens. But a standalone headset, by definition, has no touch screen. So we've had to build a new VR window manager deep into Android so that we have an operating system where all the system UI will be accessible in VR. Also with Daydream Euphrates, we're updating the Daydream home experience for both smartphones and standalone headsets. First, we're going to make it easy to discover the best content in VR. You'll see a curated list of continuously updated stream of content with thematic collections mixing together thousands of videos, experience, games, and apps. Now, once you're in the VR experience, we don't want to break that sense of immersion. So Daydream Euphrates also has a new dashboard that embraces the immersive nature of VR and appears right on top of any app. It's super fast to load and lets you stay in VR. You won't have to leave the experience to check a notification, change settings, or even to switch apps. So now that we've made it easy to stay in VR, we want to help you share that experience with others, even if they're not wearing a VR headset. So today, I'm excited to announce Cast support is coming to Daydream. With this feature, thank you, thank you. It's one of our top requested features. So with this feature, uh, you'll be able to pull up the dashboard and simply select a casting destination. As you go from app to app, your cast station stays. Now, casting, what I love about it is it changes the VR experience from an individual experience to a shared experience and really brings your friends and family into the fun with you. Now, casting is good for people who are physically near you, but what about everyone else? To help you share your favorite moments in VR, we're also adding the ability to capture a screenshot or a short video of your daydream experience and share it on your favorite social media or messaging app. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so that's a quick look at what's coming with Daydream Euphrates. In addition to this, there's many, many other features, including many for developers. Um, and you can learn more about that in our other sessions or obviously on our developer website. To sum it all up, we've got tens of millions of Daydream Ready phones by the end of the year, a new class of standalone VR headsets, and a brand new update to the Daydream software we call Euphrates that's coming later this year for both smartphone VR and for standalone headsets. So finally, I spoke a little bit ago about making it easier to share your VR experience with others. We think this is really critical for users to keep them engaged, and also where perhaps some of the most innovative experiences will come. So let me welcome Aaron from the YouTube VR team, who's going to tell you about some of the things YouTube VR is doing 
to make shared experiences a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin. I'm a product manager from the VR team at YouTube. We made an early bet on 360 degree and 3D video and thought a lot about how to build the YouTube VR app from the ground up for Daydream. It does everything you love about YouTube, but in a way that feels natural in a virtual world. Since we launched, people's responses have blown us away. Every time I pop in, there's something new to explore, from sports highlights to historic landmarks, deep sea dives to learning about dinosaurs. No matter what you're passionate about, YouTube MVR can take you there, thanks to the huge library of hundreds of thousands of immersive videos. So there are all these amazing places you can go, see, and learn about. You probably want to share these experiences with other people. It's just better that way. From co-watching parties to creators engaging with their fans, YouTube already has an incredible community that's built around its content. And we want to bring that to VR. So here's a sneak peek into something that we're working on. Later this year, we'll be rolling out an update that lets you co-watch YouTube videos with other people, talk about them live, and share the experience all in the same virtual room. Everyone will be able to customize the way that they look in VR, and with just a click, you can sink in to watch what others are watching, too. For example, anyone can connect with other Gorillaz fans to watch their latest music video in a virtual front row. For me, VR video goes well beyond games, entertainment, and music. So many creators, like this one, use VR to inspire empathy and compassion. In fact, there is no other technology that lets you walk in someone else's shoes, experience things that you can't in real life, and gain a new perspective on important topics. With this update to YouTube VR and the addition of casting and capture to Daydream, which Mike announced, there will soon be more ways for you to enjoy VR together. Now, let me pass this off to Andre, who's going to talk to you a bit about tools for VR and AR developers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andre. I lead apps and developer tools at Daydream. Hey, so much exciting progress on AR and VR platform side. But of course, platforms are defined by the best experiences available on them, experiences built by developers like you. To build great stuff, you need great tools. So today, I want to tell you about three new tools we developed to help you iterate faster, push the limits of mobile graphics, and bring your immersive experiences to the whole web. First of all, let's talk about iteration time. <laughs> it's early days of immersive computing, so it's all about experimenting. You need to be able to try many new ideas as quickly as possible. And to evaluate VR content, you really need to experience it firsthand in the target hardware. But we know from many mobile developers, it might take minutes from when you make a change in the editor to when you see the result on device. We timed it. I mean, it takes three minutes sometimes, but maybe five or seven for a larger project. I can hit build, go toast myself a bagel, and come back before it's done deploying. So we knew we had to take the iteration time down from minutes to seconds. And that is why we built Instant Preview. This is a tool that lets you make changes in your desktop and instantly see them in your VR device. Thank you. <laughs> Instant Preview is deeply integrated in both the editor and the mobile device. We send the sensor data from headset and the controller to the PC, which emulates and renders the scene. And the result is sent back to the device as a stereo video stream. And the cool thing is that we can do it with low latency so that you can comfortably use it in VR while tweaking interactions in real time. The result is a continuous, uninterrupted development flow. Instant Preview, Instant Preview is launching today for both Unity and Unreal. 
You can download it right now. Check it out. Now, now let's talk about graphics. VR makes you feel like you're somewhere else. So the visual fidelity of the virtual environment matters a lot. And of course, with six degree of freedom devices, you just can't get away by wrapping in 360 panorama as a background. You have to render a full 3D scene. However, what you can render in real time depends on the amount of power you have available. There's a huge gap between what you can do on a 4-watt mobile device, 400-watt PC, or say a 4,000-node render farm. But what if we could bridge this gap? What if we could achieve desktop-level graphics on a mobile VR headset like our standalone? We can't change laws of physics, of course, but we can be very clever. I want to introduce a new tool we call Seurat, after the great French painter. With this tool, you can take a high-fidelity scene, like the one from PC game, and run it in mobile VR in real time. How does this work? As a developer, you define a volume within which you want the user to move around and view your scene. You also define target parameters like number of polygons and overdraw. And then you let the tool do its magic. It takes dozens of images from different parts of this defined volume. And then it automatically generates an entirely new 3D scene that looks identical to the original, but is dramatically simplified. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. And you still can have dynamic interactive elements in it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. But wait a minute. If we can do something like this, why would you stop at desktop level graphics? What if you take a scene so complex it can't possibly run in real time, even on the most powerful PC, like something from a movie? Let me show you a project we worked on with ILM X Lab, the branch of Lucasfilm that is focused on pioneering next generation immersive experiences. One of their goals is to bring you inside of Star Wars. Let's see what they've been able to do with Syrah. Let's roll the video. Lab's mission is really to create immersive, premium, story-based entertainment experiences. And our goal is for people to step inside the worlds of our stories, and in this case, into the world of Star Wars. When there are events, uh, locations, characters, something that has to be fabricated, they turn to visual effects to create that imagery. The depth of the world that we would like you to step into is as uh, thoughtful and uh, creative and exacting as anything we might put in our films. This new technology from Google is enabling us to do something we've been trying to find for a while. We take high quality cinematic renders and we can turn them into something that's real time consumable. When XLab was approached by Google, they said that they could take our ILM renders and make them run in real time on a VR phone. Turns out it's true. You can have um, very dense, complex scenes with very sophisticated shading that uh, traditionally can't run in real time on an engine. When I see people in our demo looking at the floor and going on their hands and knees down to expect the curvature of every little bend and twist, I really think we're onto something. Uh, that potentially opens the door to, you know, cinematic realism in VR. So ILM X Lab brought the cinema quality world of Rogue One onto our mobile VR headset. I mean, this scene is around 50 million triangles and three gigabytes of textures. Normally, each frame here takes an hour to render offline on a high-performance machine. However, after processing with Sura, it now takes 13 milliseconds per frame on a mobile GPU. We reduced the texture size by a factor of 300 and the number of polygons by a factor of 1,000. Now it's comfortably running in real time on our standalone VR headset with six degrees of freedom. And it looks as good as the original. How cool is that? Well, with this technology, 
you, you as a developer will be able to build visually stunning experiences while still targeting mobile VR hardware. Serrat so already supports Unity, Unreal, and Maya. And we are currently experimenting with a smaller set of partners. We'll start rolling out the tool more broadly later this year. So please stay tuned. All right, now um, let's talk about the world's largest developer ecosystem, the web. Three years ago, we co-authored Web VR Spec. It allowed developers to build immersive 3D applications with JavaScript and WebGL and run them in the browser. This way, you're leveraging the strength of the web itself. Your code is standards-based, it adapts to different kinds of devices, and it's easy to distribute it with a link. Now, imagine you're a user in a VR headset. Where do you go to discover a web VR experience? How do you serve the web in VR? Well, I'm excited to announce we're bringing the full Chrome browser in VR. Let me show you a preview. You'll be able to use Daydream Controller to navigate any regular web page and follow links. And for web VR experiences, you just get transported into fully immersive worlds. And of course, you'll be able to watch any web video in a theater-like environment with a large screen. What I love about Chrome and VR is that it's the same app I'm using for browsing in 2D, which means all of my bookmarks, history, and tabs are already there. I, I don't have to re-log into my favorite websites in VR. Things just work. Browsing in VR feels great, and it's coming to Chrome for Android later this year. But the web is not only for virtual reality. We actually see big potential in the context of augmented reality, too. You see, web connects world's information. And AR connects information with a physical world. So together, they can be applied for solving real-life problems. I want to show you what AR features in the browser could look like. Let's say you're searching for a new coffee table. You're probably browsing online stores, and you're looking at some pictures on your phone. But you don't really want pictures on the phone. You want the furniture in your room. This is one example where connecting physical world and information would be very handy. With AR-enabled browser, your favorite website could ask you to mark the physical space you have available, and then it would only show you the items that fit in this area. And of course, you'll be able to preview search results in the context of your actual room from any angle. And you know what's cool? Thank you. You know what's cool? You, you didn't have to install a new app just for that. I mean, everything you're seeing here is, is built with JavaScript and WebGL, and it's running in our experimental browser. So with WebVR, we will enable, to easily, uh, enable developers to easily integrate AR features into your existing websites. Just like we did with WebVR, we're starting by releasing an experimental build of Chromium, which exposes AR features like positional and depth data. It's available today. You can download it from GitHub. And we're excited to see what the community does with it. Our goal is to make Web VR and Web AR first-class citizens in all browsers. And that is it for developer tools. Thanks so much for spending some of your morning with us. We we'll look forward to partnering with you, making sure you have both the platforms and the tools to bring your next great idea to life. Make sure you check out our other talks and come over to Tango Booth to check out the demo. Thank you very much. We have with us Aparna Sridhar, who is a product manager at Hacker Rank. There are so many people who really look up to you. What really inspired you into technology? I started like writing my first program when I was say in sixth standard. You know, just playing around with basic back in the days when you know we had dial-up connection. And when I decided what to do for uh, you know undergraduate studies. 
that's when um, you know I had the option to again pick um, computer science and at that point in time I did it back to this enjoyable experience I had as a child and thought maybe I would give that a try. Tell us about your experience as lead coach for the Udacity uh, Android Nano degree. Something that I would like to highlight about teaching is that it's been like the most uh, fulfilling and gratifying, you know, experience. Can I help that one student who almost wants to give up on programming, who almost feels like this experience is too hard? If I can help that one person at a time, uh, you know, progress, I feel like later in their life, sometimes they would they would look back to do it for somebody else again. What is your message to the women in tech out there? Mm -hmm. We undergo a lot of stereotypes. I cannot tell you the number of times I'm the only woman in the room and automatically the question is, are you in sales, are you in marketing? The more women can do to like break that stereotype, to like embrace more of these roles, um, you know, the more we can change this perspective that we do have in tech. Thank you so much, Aparna. Welcome. This is our first certification summit. You guys and ladies are among the first certified Android developers. The developer base growing very fast, going and becoming the largest developer base in the world. The interesting point is that India is a mobile first market, however the percentage of developers developing for mobile is relatively low. So we're trying to really supercharge that. India is one of the emerging markets. 80% of the smartphone growth rate is expected till 2019. You guys are Android certified developers. And, and just, just imagine that you are going to reach these many people with your applications that you're going to develop. They are not trying to solve for the entire world. They're trying to solve for their own users. You are, at the end of the day, developing a product not for yourself. You are developing for end consumer. So I'm going to talk to you guys about what's new with Android O. Any of you guys use some of the Firebase 2.0 features? Yes, it's about recognition, it's about getting a job, it's about growing your career, but there are bigger forces at play. I feel that development, mobile development, Android, can make a difference actually in the world, fixing problems in one's own community, whether it's uh, uh, water, education, environment. But we want to support you connecting to communities and create change in the world. Firebase makes authentication easy for end users and developers. Most applications need to know the identity of a user so they can provide a customized experience and keep their data secure. Firebase supports lots of different ways for your users to authenticate. If your users want to authenticate with their email address, you can build that for them. Firebase Auth has built-in functionality for third-party providers such as Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, and Google. It can also integrate with your existing account system if you have one. You're given the choice about how to present login to the user. You can build your own interface, or you can take advantage of our open source UI, which is fully customizable and incorporates years of Google's experience in building simple sign-in UX. No matter which one you use, once a user authenticates, three things happen. Information about the user is returned to the device via callbacks. This allows you to personalize your app's user experience for that specific user. The user information contains a unique ID which is guaranteed to be distinct across all providers, never changing for a specific authenticated user. This unique ID is used to identify your user and what parts of your backend system they're authorized to access. Firebase will also manage your user session so that users will remain logged in after the browser or application restarts. And of course, it works on Android, iOS, and the web. That's Firebase Auth, allowing you to focus on your users and not the sign-in infrastructure to support them. Thank you for joining us here today. India is coming a long way, as I just mentioned. Today, India is the second largest country in the world in terms of number of developers. Soon, it's going to be number one. What we want to invest in is actually training the faculty from your colleges. The potential is so great. And what Google is doing to help catalyze that innovation is it's really an exciting time for these campuses. We are really trying to provide the best possible experience to teachers in these faculty hubs because the first step to training 2 million developers is to train the teachers that are going to teach those 2 million. Industry as of now demands a lot of uh, updated curriculum. Developing 2 million 
Android developers. Uh, being working in a technical university, we can contribute hugely on developing those uh, million app developers. So we're excited that all the raw materials are there to create an innovation revolution in India. Uh, I really think the students are going to make some great things and I can't wait to see what comes out. There's a lot of potential in India and uh, we need to take it forward. With Google, we can provide rich opportunities to all. That is the essence of Google program which I have seen. This is a good move and this program will definitely be useful to, uh, to the students because app development is going to rule the world for the next few years, Billy. Just waiting for the shot to finish. Okay, there we are. So I'm here with Daniel in the community lounge where people from all over the world are gathering at Google I.O. Can you tell us a little bit about the activities going on here and uh, what people are saying? Yeah, the lounge, it's pretty new on the I.O. Like we used to have community areas on the I.O. but nothing huge like this. I don't know if the camera can capture it, but this is basically like the whole tent, like the front porch of it. And as you can see, it's crowded and people come here to chill, to play, they play pool, we have some wooden block building games, we've got some networking games, people chatting. You don't hear me saying we have any gadgets here. This is completely unplugged and like people here maybe come to relax a little bit from all the technology which happens in the tents everywhere else and they just sit back and relax and talk to other people. So we are the place sort of maybe to unplug from the technology for a little bit. We also have some local meetups. So I'm with GDGs. Uh, I'm in the community team in Google. So we help communities around the world to do meetups. So we thought, why don't we do meetups here? So we have about 25 small meetups and it's anything for like people who did applications for social good or just now I think there is a meetup of Russian speaking developers so we have the whole list they come here they meet it's very unprogrammed very anarchistic in a way <laughs> uh, so we have also a bunch of Googlers coming here to relax from the IO madness I love it I hope you do it next year and when you come next year you know, make sure you drop by awesome well let's check out some of the stuff awesome let's go So this IO17 hello world hashtag, uh, hashtag IO17 hashtag hello world, you can actually check it right now if you are bored with my face. And what happens is that we are building a bridge here, but communities, they don't function with a boss or blueprint, etc. So this experiment is about what happens if we want to construct maybe the next golden gate without blueprints or managers. Uh, you see, it's pretty chaotic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Timothy, I know, like we are not golden gate bridge quality yet. Maybe we will not be ever. As I said, this is an experiment. We are on day one. So we'll see how it goes. We also ask people to, if they are developers, to write hello world in their first programming language. Oh, so wow. I hit mine here, like 10 print hello world in basic. I was very tempted to say 20, go to 10, you know, and see, <laughs> <laughs> see the wooden blocks being covered everywhere here. Uh, so you can see we have uh, plenty of languages here. So yeah, let's see, let's see what, uh, what happened. <laughs> All right, so Timothy, I know I said the launch is unplugged, but this is a, I was cheating. This is an exception. Like, as you can see, this is very much plugged in. But what we are playing here is something that I want to tell you informally. We are not publishing. This is a uh, YouTube playlist of some of the greatest GDG trailers and videos from around the world. Google developer groups, they organize meetups, events, activities, and they sometimes put crazy videos online. So we made like a two hour playlist out of that. You can find this whole screen on your own screen if you enter the address bit.ly slash launch TV. I'm not saying don't say it to anyone because I just said it to you, but you can be here with us at least virtually through this playlist. So enjoy. Cool. So what is this? Yeah, you had seen the movie Inception, right? And in the keynote in the morning today, you were talking about the Inception. So this is a device. I don't know what for. I don't know what it will do to you. I mean, if people want to see more videos of you, I don't know if you want to sit in it. But yeah, let's try it. This is a core workout. <laughs> This is kind of like planking, but better. 
Yeah, you, you can get a hangover from this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me introduce Nino. Nino is from Georgia, and she's running one of the meetups I was talking about. And this meetup is... What is it about, Nino? Who is it for? Um, this meetup is for developers mostly, and we cover the topics of how we can develop apps or use current apps for social good. So basically, the social aspects that our apps can have, because technologies have so many opportunities, and it can really, you know, go beyond just consumer um, Yeah, it's like it can serve so much more purposes. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing my own experience, how my team at Elva and Structure are helping to, you know, help people in conflict and uh, crisis situations to better monitor situations or how you are helping farmers with information and probably get some more ideas from others. So it is very informal, very improvised because everyone is in the line for ice cream. So <laughs> I hope that Samuel joins and it's going to be just um, a friendly session and thanks to Dan for, for this opportunity. I think it's fun and cool. So do develop apps for social good. <laughs> awesome, thank you. So you're welcome to join. <laughs>
and you can then see a reporting information about uh, the number of installs your app has on that particular device or on that group of devices, um, how much revenue you're getting, how your ratings compare, which can really help you to understand uh, whether any of the bad behaviors, any of these problems that users may be having with your app are concentrated in a particular area, which can be critical to optimizing and making your app super high quality. So we're founding, uh, even just in the initial testing, which we've now uh, completed, this uh, feature is rolling out to all developers. We found our early testers have really embraced the, uh, the, these tools. It's really helping them to be much more uh, surgical in the way they think about targeting their app and, uh, and making it a great experience for the end user. Uh, in addition to the features that help developers to build higher quality apps, uh, we've also got a number of features which help to mitigate risk during the release process. And so when you're releasing a new version of your app, you may have an installed base of millions, uh, potentially hundreds of millions of users. If you're pushing out a new version of your app, you, uh, you know, it can otherwise be a worrying time. You don't want to know that, uh, that, that bugs are causing uh, uninstalls. Uh, you don't want to know that information late. So we have uh, a new release dashboard uh, with very low latency reporting that helps you to have visibility of these metrics uh, on the hour, every hour, as wow. it's starting to roll out to potentially global audience of, of hundreds of millions of devices. Um, and so this can help you to manage a release uh, with a lot more confidence. A third area where we're launching new features uh, right here at I.O. Is, uh, is in the business area. And so um, developers, in addition to building amazing experiences, they want to make money, they want to grow their business. Uh, we have a lot of new reporting, uh, including for app developers that have a subscription-based model. You can look at uh, subscription by tenure, look at cohorts from when they've started, uh, when they've installed the app, um, and how that life cycle trends over time. You can help to see how different uh, inflection points are contributing to subscription renewals or people uh, leaving a subscription. So it can really help you to manage your subscription business. Um, and then in general, we have a lot of statistics that are available through the Play Console. In the past, they weren't always easily navigable. Um, we have a new configurable statistics page. In that page, developers are much more easily able to slice and dice these metrics much more easily able to, um, to create um, custom configurations, to compare different time periods against each other, to compare one, uh, one metric against another, and to introduce benchmarks of whole classes of apps so they can see how some of them uh, compares to peers uh, who make similar apps. And so we think uh, that features like this will really help developers to manage their apps as a business as well. Wow, that was a lot of stuff. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of Google I.O. Hopefully, you've met a lot of really great people, learned about the coolest new technology, and seen some great product launches. 
But there's one launch that you haven't seen. And I am so confident in this launch that on stage at Google I.O., I'm announcing that I'm leaving Google to start a startup to build this app. And in short, this idea, it's so revolutionary. I want you, all of you, to share your story with your friends, with your family, with everyone on the internet. You deserve to share your story. Nobody has done this before, absolutely nobody. So I'm confident that we'll be the first to market. And I'm so confident, in fact, that I've already called all of my VC friends, and we have meetings scheduled an hour from now. But I think I was a little too confident. We actually don't have anything yet. So I have this great idea. But in order to get funding, I need to show that it's a viable concept. I need an Android app, an iOS app, and a web app to actually prove that, that we can get users. So I have a bunch of really smart people at Google, and they all told me, build an app that looks like this. So have an application, your web app, your mobile app, that talks to some database server. And that database server proxies all those app requests out to the storage systems, databases, and APIs. That server is going to have all of my authentication logic, all of my business logic. It will control who can read and write the stories and where those stories get sent. But that sounds like just a ton of work, and I scheduled meetings for like 45 minutes from now. So I can't build this alone. I've asked a couple of my friends to come out and help. Jenny, Frank, and Kat, can you guys help me? Love it. We all have a friend like that, right, who comes up with this great app idea and then sort of gives you 30 minutes to build it, because how hard is it to build an app, especially here, live on stage? So it's a tricky, tricky situation. We have to build three applications, and we have, what did he say, 30 minutes? So let's not do this architecture. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be using Firebase to build these applications. And that means that the application code talks directly to our powerful managed backend services. This means that Firebase takes care of all the things like scalability and security so that we can focus on building the features that our users love. It takes a bit of time to set everything up. So while the team is prepping on their laptops, I'm actually going to talk a bit about how we're using Firebase and building this application. So remember, we are building a story sharing app. So we're taking a picture on our phone or selecting a picture on a laptop, and then we're sharing it with the other users of the app. First thing we need to do there is we need to allow the users to sign in. And we're using Firebase authentication for that. Second thing is that we need a place where we can store and share the photos. So for that, we're going to be using cloud storage. And finally, we need a way to uh, store and synchronize metadata between the users. And that's the Firebase database. We're going to go through each of these features in turn. I'm going to explain how we use it in the app. And then we're going to switch over to the code and see how it works in practice. So you're going to be experiencing firsthand how easy it is to build an app with Firebase. First up, Firebase authentication. It's our secure serverless sign-in solution. So we've taken all the complexity of storing email addresses and passwords, server-side OAuth flows, and we've wrapped them in a single cross-platform client-side API. That means that your users can sign in with Google, Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, or email passwords. And if you've watched any of the sessions so far about Firebase, you know that we now also support phone number authentication. And that's great, because that means that even if your users don't have an account, they can just sign in from their phone, get a verification text message, and continue using the application. To speed things up a bit today, we're going to be using Firebase UI which is our open source library for authentication. So it handles all of the complex flows that you might have, like, is this a new user or a returning user? Do they want to sign in with Facebook or Google? And for example, password resets, email verification, account linking. Actually, it handles a lot. It's an open source library built by the identity experts at Google, and it includes years of experience and best practices for sign-in flows. OK, I think that's pretty much what we need to know. Can we switch to the split screen to do some coding? 
Okay. So to speed things up, we're going to be building all three applications at the same time. So at the, let's see, top left, you see Mike's screen. And Mike is building the iOS version of our Fire Stories app. At the bottom left, you see Kat's screen, and Kat is working on the web version. And at the top right, you see Jenny's screen. But hold on, Jenny, that doesn't look like Java code that I'm used to. No. Did you switch over to Kotlin last night? Yes, I switched that's, it last night. Actually, that's going to be great, because it's going to be so much less code that you need to write for this. OK. So they've all already built the basic framework for the application. So they've added the layouts that they need to show the stories and added the inputs where the user can select or take a picture and uh, the button where they can send it. So if we now run the app, we can access the device's camera or the local file browser, and we can take or select a picture. But if we hit send, nothing happens. That's because we're not using Firebase yet. So in the bottom right, you see the Firebase console. This is where you manage all of your Firebase projects. We've already created a project that will serve as the back end for this application. Now, all these applications, whether it's iOS, web, or Android, are talking against the same back end services. So they share the same list of users, the same file storage, and the same database. And that is great, because that means that they're sharing all their state. We've taken the configuration data of this project and added it to each of the platforms. So now the apps can find their backend services on the Google servers. We've also already added the SDK to each of the apps. So we've done a pod install, a Gradle dependency, and we added a script include. So with that, I think we're ready to start coding. First thing, first thing we need to do is we take the features that we're using about Firebase and import them from the SDK into our code. We do this in one go for all three features that we're using, auth, storage, and database. You can see that the code looks exactly the same for every feature. So we have a cross-feature consistency with Firebase. That's great, because it allows you to start using new features quickly. But if you actually glance from screen to screen, you see that it is really also very similar between platforms. And that is great, because it means that you learn Firebase on one platform. Then when you switch to another platform, you take what you've learned and use it on the new platform also. I think we're now wiring up Firebase authentication. So let's get to that one. First thing we need to do there is that we need to configure Firebase UI for the providers that we want to use. So today, we're only using Google sign-in, because we only have a few minutes left. We also, in the Firebase console, enabled this provider. Next, we're going to wait until the user clicks the sign-in button. And when they do, we start the sign-in flow. Now, this is a very short amount of code, but it triggers all the complex flows that you can imagine. So if the user signs in on an iOS device tomorrow, but on an Android device the day after, they still have the same stories. And when they want to sign in with Facebook today, but with Google tomorrow, it handles account linking for you. All that be behind this simple code. What we need to do is listen for when the authentication state changes. And when it does, it's either one of two things. Either the authentication succeeded, or the user did not sign in. If the user signed in, we hide the sign in button, show the sign out button. We enable any other UI elements that require an authenticated user. And that's really all we need to do. So if we now run the application, we have sign in working. Let's see who gets there first. I think Kat is already signing in. You can see that we get pop-ups. We get to pick our account. If we have multiple Google accounts, we get an account picker. All of that is handled for us with the minimal code that you just saw. But just signing in on an app is not very interesting. So let's switch back to slides and see how we're going to be using cloud storage. If you've ever used Google Cloud Storage before, you know that it's our petabyte scale storage solution. Firebase provides a cross-platform client-side SDK on top of cloud storage that allows you to upload files securely directly from your device. 
We provide a security model on top of this so that you can ensure only authorized users have access to those files from their device. But whenever you upload a new file through Firebase, you also get a download URL. This is an unguessable URL that provides read-only access to that same file. And that is great for our Fire Stories app today, because we can use that to share the image between all our users. I actually think there's nothing more we need to know about cloud storage. So let's switch back to the code and see how we make this work. OK. We're back in the code. Remember, we already imported the feature before. So what we now do is um, we have a local file that the user took with their camera or selected from the file browser. First thing we need to do is we need to figure out where we're going to store that file in cloud storage. And it's going to consist of two pieces. So the first piece is the user's UID. So this is the identification of the authenticated user. And by putting this in the path, we actually make sure that the files from the, the various users end up in different locations. That is great, because that means that we can use Firebase's server-side security rules to ensure that only the authorized user has access to their files, so that if Mike uploads a new story, only he can change that picture. The second part of the path is really just a unique file name. Because since we are writing to the same cloud storage location, we want to make sure that we don't override files we uploaded previously. OK. Next step is that we start uploading the local file to that storage location. So we take the storage reference that we just created, and we tell Firebase to put the file to that location. This is all we need to do to start the upload in the background. Now, Think of all the things we did not have to do here. We didn't spin up any threads. There were no async adapters, no background tasks, no Grand Central dispatch. All we did was tell Firebase to start uploading the file, and it went to work. All we have to do is wait for the upload to complete. And when it does, one of two things can have happened. Either the upload succeeded, or it failed. If it failed, we take the error message that we get from Firebase, we show it to the user. And if the upload succeeded, we take the download URL of the file that was just uploaded, and we display that on the local screen. That is all we need. So if we now run this app, we'll be able to upload files to cloud storage. I see Cat is already selecting an image. Hmm. We don't really see a lot yet. If in the console we switch to the storage tab, in the Firebase console on the bottom right. Ted, can you switch in the console? Can we go back to the split screen? Thank you. So we have files here now. These files were just uploaded, but not a really impressive way of uploading a file, but it is a very cute dog in there. OK. So clearly, we can now upload files to the cloud. Not really what we wanted yet. Nothing we can go to our VCs with. So we're going to be using the third Firebase feature to actually share the information between our users. Let's switch back to the presentation. The Firebase database is our oldest feature. And it's still one of our most popular backend services. We have hundreds of thousands of applications that rely on our database every day. The Firebase database is a cloud-hosted NoSQL database. It's really just a JSON tree. And if you've ever modeled your data with JSON, you know that it's very flexible. So this is the data model that we're using today. At the top level, you see that we have a node called Stories. And under that, we have a child node for each individual story. And then for each of those stories, we keep the download URL. Remember, that's the unguessable but publicly readable URL. We keep the title that the user entered for that story. We also keep the user ID of the user who created the story. And just like before with storage, having the UID in the database allows us to secure access to the story with Firebase's server-side security rules. So that is great, because it means that when Cat enters a story, only she can change the title of that story. We call our database a real-time database. We do that because of the way you read your data from it. So with most databases, you do something like select star from stories. 
and then you'd get the list of stories back and you'd display it on the screen. With Firebase, you attach or, uh, a listener or an observer to the stories node. And from that moment on, Firebase will tell you whenever something changes under the stories node. So when Jen uploads a new story, Kat and Mike get informed of that instantly. And when then uh, Jen responds to that story, Mike gets the update straight away. This is real-time synchronization, and it's really, really easy. In fact, let's not take my word for it. Let's switch back to the code and add the final feature to the app. OK, so let's see. We already imported the database. So we're going to go back to where we uploaded the file and we added it to the local screen. So we're first going to remove that code. We're not going to display the story anymore because we are going to instead write the metadata of the story to the database. So to do that, we create a reference to the stories node in the database. And since we point to that same node in each of the apps, they're going to be writing to the same location in the same database. And that makes data sharing really easy. But since they're writing to the same location, we also need to make sure we have a unique ID for the story that we're creating. So we're calling push or child by auto ID for that. With that, we're ready to write the metadata. So we take the reference that we just created, and we write the values of our story to it. So we write the download URL that everyone can display. We write the text that the user entered. We write their UID so that we can secure access to the story. And finally, we also write the path in cloud storage, because I think that might come in handy at some point, but I'm not sure where yet. I just have a feeling. Now we can run the app again. And if we do, and we pick a story, it will write that data to the database. If you look at the bottom right, you see that we've opened the database panel in the Firebase console. And now we're going to wait for the stories to pour in. I see that Mike is already selecting an image. Cat is working. You can see that the database lights up as the new stories come in. That is great. But there's one problem left. Ooh, smile, you're on camera. There's one problem left. It doesn't show on the local screens anymore. So that's the final step we need to take in our code. We're almost done here, folks. So we're going to attach a listener to the same node that we had before, to the stories node. And we're going to ask Firebase for the last 10 stories. Now, from that moment on, whenever a new story is added, Firebase will fire the child added event. And with that event, we get a snapshot of the story. So we take the value out of that snapshot. That's the value that we just wrote, right? And we display it on the local screen again by calling display story. That's it. This handles most situations. We're going to do one extra one, because I've been telling about changing the story securely so much that I want to make sure that works too. So in addition to handling child edit, we're also going to listen for changes to the stories, which works with a child changed event. So now whenever somebody changes a story, we get a snapshot of the updated story. We take the value and the key of that story, and we update the display on the local screen. I think we're ready to run. So now you can see that if we run the app, stories that we just created actually are already showing on each local screen. So that child edit event that we were talking about fires immediately for any existing children. But now, as they're taking more pictures and writing more stories, those stories show up on all screens within milliseconds. This is how you build a multi-user story sharing application with Firebase. In fact, I'm not sure. I didn't read the full spec of the requirements, but I think we're pretty much done here, Mike. And it took, what, like 15 minutes? I think we have like 40 minutes left to actually go, go play in the ball pit. What was it? I hope they like oh. it. What's, what's wrong, Jen? What's wrong? Wait a second, Frank. I'm just getting a call. It's, it's our VC. Uh-oh. Our VC says that there's already a bunch of apps that do basically this thing. No way. And wait, wait, you want what? Oh my gosh. Frank, we need to pivot, uh -oh. like now. 
A good thing we have like 20 minutes left. So it turns out, um, if we go back to the slides, um, boop, it turns out that there are a lot of apps out there already that do real-time communication, that do chat and pictures and text and stuff. And it turns out that's so a few years ago. Um, and people are interested in new stuff now. Specifically, um, people are tired of reading text and looking at their pictures. Instead, they want to look at their pictures and look at other tiny pictures next to their big pictures. So we need to emojify our app today. But it's OK. Pivots are hard, but we've been thinking ahead. Our Skunk Works engineering team has already thought of this and already developed a really cool emojification algorithm that'll take us to the next round of funding. But like any big engineering change, we have a few challenges that we're facing. You know, we're pivoting. For example, um, we have somehow burnt through a lot of our engineering resources already. I think it might have something to do with the bouncy castle in the break room. Anyway, we don't have time to write it for all three platforms anymore. We have to take our original modification algorithm and write it once so we don't have to port it to all the different platforms. Another problem we have is our modification algorithm is super great and targets really well, but it consumes a lot of resources. And although mobile devices are faster than ever before, their battery life has been kind of flat over the last few years. And like, we need to make sure that we uh, save our users' batteries so they can be taking tiny pictures of their big pictures all day. And finally, security. So we have our proprietary modification algorithm, but as you build out an application, you end up with secrets that are part of your app, whether they be API keys or other stuff like that. And if you put them into your app and deploy them to the world, some of your beloved but possibly nefarious users are going to find that information and might do bad things with it. And we don't want our modification algorithm to leak out, because that would ruin us. But it's even more OK, because the same Skunk Works engineering team that developed the emojification algorithm has also come up with the solution to the problem. Turns out, Cloud Functions are the solution to the problem. So Cloud Functions allow us to take our already written JavaScript emojification algorithm um, that we developed on, on Node.js and port it over and deploy it to the cloud um, where it solves all of our problems. First of all, we only have to write it once, and then we can hook it up to all of our apps because Cloud Functions integrate wonderfully with the rest of the Firebase SDK. And um, it also allows us to run on Google servers in the cloud, which, as it turns out, are plugged into Maine's electricity. And since it's deployed to the cloud, we don't have to worry about people extracting information from our, our deployed apps. So we have a solution, we have a plan, and we have some JavaScript. The first thing to do to appease the VCs is, of course, to update the architecture slide, since this is how they think. Um, this is where we left off before. We have our application on one side. Um, that uh, This is all the different applications, all the platforms, that are using the Firebase SDK to communicate with the database and storage. And this is how stuff gets synchronized between them. So we're going to shift the apps up a little bit, and we're going to plop Cloud Functions right here. Cloud Functions, um, when integrating with Firebase, kind of act like another client. It's like a super um, client that's there all the time and can always uh, uh, watch for changes uh, that happen, make all those heavy lifting operations, and then push them back to Firebase, uh, to the database and to storage, where the clients will automatically get notified, just like as if another client did the update. So I could talk about this all day. But why don't I just show you with some code? Sound good? Switch back to the code. So here we are. And we have down in the lower corner, Kat is our JavaScript whiz. And she has been the one who developed this emojification algorithm. So she will take the helm today. And as you can see, she started out with a few imports, like our emojification algorithm. Um, but she's ready to get coding. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to write out a function header. Um, this is where you actually wire it up to the Firebase database. Here you can see that it, is, uh, it has a path to Firebase, and it is listening for writes on that location. Because we're integrating with the already existing app, um, this listens to the same location where our stories appear today. It's going to behave just like an app, so we're going to have a snapshot handy. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to unpack the title with boring old text from the snapshot. 
Then we're going to do the magic. We're going to take that title and we're going to pass it off to our emojification algorithm, which will take the title in and a wonderful stream of emoji will come out. Finally, we're going to take that emojified title and we're going to stash it back into the database um, in a new field um, in the each story um, that gets updated. But we have to do one more thing before we can deploy it. Uh, the behavior for triggering on functions is a little bit different than on the clients. It will actually trigger for each write instead of on the slightly more specific child added event. So we're going to add a short circuit up to the top to make sure that we don't actually accidentally re emojify something that's already been processed. And with that, we're ready to deploy. So we're going to go and deploy that code up to the cloud. And here's the really cool part. Our applications were already aware of this field um, when they displayed the stories. So we don't have to deploy the app. So you don't even have to recompile the Android app. We can just run it, and all the new titles that get added are automatically going to get emojified. And people can be super happy looking at all those little tiny pictures. And that's great, because we're saved now, right? We have emoji in our app, and we can buy that kombucha on tap. Hold on. Wait, what? My friend Dog is calling. And my friend Dog says, we've been mislabeling dogs. People are really bad at identifying dogs and call them sheep and oh my bananas. Gosh. And what's that? You're afraid people will upload bad photos? <gasps> Who would do bad things on the internet? I don't know. Oh, cat photos, yeah. Uh. You can see the temptation. Yeah. All right, well, it looks like we have some more work cut out for us. So let's go back to the slides, because I've got an idea we'll be able to use machine learning. We will be able to fix this problem. And I bet we'll be able to get the VCs on board if we can say we're using machine learning. How can we use it? Well, we'll still have people upload their photos, same as before. But instead of making them type in the title, we'll just figure out what's in the image and perform our emojification on that. And while we're there, you know, people seem to really enjoy not having to read. In fact, I'm not really sure my friend Dog can read at all. In fact, I'm not sure my friend Dog can type, so getting rid of the title is probably a great move. We can also get rid of the complicated images. Just get rid of those and keep the super simple, beautiful emoji. So our app will look something like this, just a giant stream of emoji. It'll be fantastic. But we spend all of our time engineering on the emojification algorithm, and we haven't spent any time on machine learning. Well, good thing we're at Google I.O., and cloud has some APIs that can help us with this. So let's just put a cloud on it. Every Firebase project is also a cloud project. That means we can use the same project to access the cloud APIs and the cloud SDKs. In this case, let's make use of the Vision API, which will allow us to look at an image, determine what's in that, and based on that, we'll be able to go ahead and perform our emojification algorithm and spit out a stream of emoji. So where does this fit in our architecture diagram? Here's where Jen left us off. We have cloud functions now, which act as a special client that can listen to Firebase. Now we just need a little bit of room to fit in one more new icon. So we'll just shift everything over. And bam, we have room for our Cloud Vision API. We'll create a new cloud function, which runs in a secure environment so we can put in our project information so we can talk directly to the Cloud Vision API, do that intense computation, and write it using the cloud function back to the database. So let's code one last time. The first thing we're going to want to do here is actually hook up to the Vision API. And once again, you'll want to be focusing here in the bottom left. We're using here our Firebase project credentials, the same ID. And we're going to make use of the cloud SDK as well, the cloud storage SDK as well. So now that we've hooked up our API, we're going to go ahead and define a new function. It's listening to the same place in the database, because we want to pick up those same images. We're still listening on writes, so we can fire off multiple functions from the same place. But instead of grabbing the title, which we no longer have, 
we're going to want to grab the image using the file path that Frank so kindly snuck in for us earlier. Once we have the file path, we'll be able to use the storage SDK to grab a reference to that file. And with this new reference, we'll be able to go ahead and pass that to the vision API to detect labels and find out what is in our image. Once we have the labels, the response from the vision API, we want to filter out for just the labels. And then we can emojify those labels. Once we have our emoji, the last thing we need to do is write it back to our database. Here, instead of writing to the same location, we're going to write to a new location, emojis. This allows us to differentiate between who can write and view stories versus who can look at the emojis. And honestly, everyone deserves emojis, so we're going to open this up to the world. So we'll deploy our new function, and any new images will now get emojified and labeled automatically. We'll update the clients so that they now listen to the emojis field instead of the stories field. And we'll start getting a stream of emoji, a nice, definitely comprehensible stream of emoji. So what do you think, Mike? You think we're going to be able to get that funding we need? I don't know, Kat. I say let's let our first couple users take a crack at it and see what they think. In the meantime, we'll do a quick recap. Can you switch back to slides, please? At the beginning of the talk, I presented this problem. How do we build an app in under an hour that we can present to our investors? And Frank came on stage and showed us the easiest way to do that, to use Firebase, Google's mobile platform, to build your application for Android, iOS, and the web. He used Firebase authentication to securely sign in our users, cloud storage, to upload and share those files, and the real-time database to synchronize file metadata across all of our clients. Firebase lets you build your app incredibly quickly without having to worry about managing servers or infrastructure, writing your own authentication or authorization code, or dealing with database synchronization. Then Jen and Kat showed us how to extend our app's functionality using Cloud Functions and the Cloud Vision API. These features supercharged our application and let us protect our proprietary emojification algorithms, which even though all of you have seen, they're still secret, trust me, and enhance those algorithms using the power of machine learning. And unfortunately, since you all don't work with Kat, Jenny, and Frank, we've provided a number of other tools in Firebase to provide that level of support when you have to go and build your application and pitch to your investors. Firebase offers high-quality developer documentation in a number of languages. Developer tools integrated with Android Studio and your other favorite IDEs, and high-quality free technical support. If you're interested in diving deeper into any of these concepts with Firebase, there are a number of other talks available today and tomorrow over on stage seven in the main area. And all of us and our team members will be available in Sandbox H if you have any additional questions. So let's check in on those users again. Let me give them a call. Hey, what did you think of the app? Hmm. Sorry, so you don't think a stream of emoji is a particularly useful app? Uh, hey, that's not great news, team. Um, what, are you, what are you doing, Kat? I'm, I'm coding. OK, uh, can you speed that up? We have five minutes before our I'm, investors I'm done, are calling. I'm done. You're done? How did you finish so fast? Uh, I'm really quick. OK. <laughs> Um, well, let's see what Kat did. Um, so we need to prove to our investors that this app has traction. So I need everyone in the audience to go to mosaic.io, mosaic with a J, because that makes sense, and start playing around with the app. 
Can we switch back to uh, screen number one, please? Let's take a look at what Kat whipped up in that 30 seconds. That was really impressive, Kat. Yeah, you know it. Can we get screen one, please? Or everyone, go to mojaic.io, sign in with your Google account. And what's happening is you take a photo. We use our proprietary emojification algorithm to generate the stream of emojis. And then I was talking to some of our investors earlier, and they told me that mobile, social, viral gaming is really popular for some reason. So I guess that's what Kat did. She created a social game where you build, <gasps> thank you all, by the way, for helping fill this in, a larger emoji, because that's what the world needs. So hopefully this goes well, and we'll be able to get a giant ball pit full of gummy bears at our startup. Thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of I.O. Nice. <cười> Tại vì hồi xưa mình những cái máy cái thử công nghệ tiến tiến nhất của mình có được là chắc là cái máy tính bỏ tuổi thôi. Chấm này quá quần thì phò thử computer không mà để con kháng tưởng tên ma quá bạn. Mình sẽ lên nhanh ngay. Chỉ ní chỉ phải đặt một cái liên kết, thì có thể khai đăng cái trang web đó. Bạn không thấy đây là một cái mô hình mới không? เว็บเนี่ยเป็นสิ่งที่ง่ายที่สุดแล้วในเวลานั้นที่ทําให้เราเขียนโปรแกรมได้บอกเราชอบเพราะว่ามันสวยงามที่อะไรมือเรื่องตัวเสือเราเล็กเราแตะจงมานั่งดูว่าอะไรน่าอยู่มีเราหมอกี่ยาดินถือหายกับมันเลยผู้ชิงทุ่งทั้งไม่ชอบอีเชี่ยชอบนี่ลิงท่าเชียวอ่อนหรือเปล่า我希望我是其中一个推动网页发展我希望做到的是，让这种知识更普及，更多人知道如何开发网页。Did you know that the average user has 36 apps on their device and doesn't use three quarters of them most of the time? And of those, about one third of them have only ever been used once. Well, what if that's your app? You've done the research, you've written the code, you've performed the testing, you've perfected the design, you've gotten the installs, and then nothing. So, how do you prevent this? App indexing helps you re-engage with your users through tight integration with Google Search. As well as appearing in search results, it surfaces your app through autocomplete and now on tap. All you have to do is get your app in the index. And when users search for the content that's already in your app, they'll be able to see your app directly in the search results and be able to launch it right from there. It's as easy as that. But how does it work? If your app and site have similar content, you associate them with each other. Then, your app can receive incoming links from search. On Android, these are achieved using standard Android app links, and on iOS, using standard iOS universal links. When a user searches for your content, they can then find your app. If you have the app installed, it will allow you to link directly to it. When the app launches, it sees the address of the index content and decides which screen to load to show it. It's really as easy as that. You can also use the app indexing SDK to submit content to the search engine based on how people use your app content. When people use your app, your search position can be improved. With app indexing, you get into the index, putting your app into Google search, and allowing you to re-engage your users. As a lot of developers know, there's more to having an app succeed than just building a great app. 
you want your app to be dynamic and responsive by delivering fresh content to users and quickly reacting to their changing needs. You want to test out major decisions to make sure you're doing the right thing before you push them to your entire audience. And ideally, you want to provide a tailored experience for each user, so your VIPs feel like, well, VIPs. But let's be honest, that can be a lot of work. And if you're a developer without a ton of resources, that's time you'd rather spend on other things, like building your app. That's where Firebase Remote Config comes in. Firebase Remote Config is a simple key value store that lives in the cloud. But don't let that simplicity fool you. Because it lives in the cloud, it means you're able to deploy changes that your app can read within a matter of minutes. For instance, say you've just pushed your app out to the world and you suddenly discover that your Swedish text contains some offensive language. How are you supposed to know? You don't speak Swedish. I don't blame you. But fixing that text the old-fashioned way would mean creating a new build and going through the entire publishing process again. That's something that could take days, which is an awfully long time to have 9.2 million people cursing your name. But if your app uses Firebase Remote Config, you could change that text in the cloud through the Firebase console. Kind of like this. The next time your users fire up their app, Remote Config will grab the latest values, update your app's text, and just like that, you've averted a major international crisis. Or, let's say you've got a puzzle game and you're hearing complaints from your players that level 5 is too hard. If you've configured your app using Remote Config, you could tweak those settings to give your players a few more turns and push out that change to the world. But hang on, are you sure that's the right thing to do? What if the silent majority of your users actually enjoy the challenge of a more difficult level? And by making it easier, you're going to turn away your most hardcore and potentially highest paying customers. How could you test whether or not this change is a good one? Sounds like you need an A-B test. That's where Remote Config's audience segmentation feature comes in. This allows you to deliver different configurations to different groups of users simultaneously. So you can try out your new level settings with half your users while keeping the old settings with the other half. But audience segmentation isn't just great for A-B testing. Maybe you've got a feature change that could have a major impact on your in-app economy. Or maybe you just want to double check that some new networking code isn't going to set your servers on fire. You can use Firebase Remote Config to gradually roll out these changes, trying them first with a small percentage of your users before pushing them out to your entire audience. Remote Config can also deliver different configuration sets to your users based on all sorts of different factors, from device type or locale to any audience segment you've defined in Firebase Analytics. So you can send out one welcome message to your New Zealand customers and another to your Australian ones, or only show your Review This App button to people who use your app every day, or you can change your home screen experience for your customers who have spent large amounts of money on in-app purchases, so they feel special. Remote Config is backed by a client library on iOS and Android that handles important tasks like caching, dealing with flaky connections, and keeping network requests lightweight, which is always a good thing. To give Remote Config a try, check out our documentation here. We can't wait to see what you build. So you've built an amazing mobile app that your users are going to love. But you want to get it into people's hands and let them see just how awesome it is. Well, AdWords helps you do this, putting ads for your app in front of billions of people that use Search, YouTube, Google Play, and more. You can quickly set up an ad campaign to reach the type of users that might be interested in your app. You only pay if the user clicks on that ad, and you can set the budget and acquisition costs that you're comfortable with. But how do you know you're reaching the right users? Maybe some will install your app and forget about it, while others will make it part of their daily lives. Firebase Analytics helps you do this. You can define events that happen in your app that you consider to be important, such as reaching the first level of your game, purchasing a fancy new pair of sunglasses, or returning every morning to check out new products. You can tell AdWords which of these events are most important to you. Then, AdWords will display ads to people who are more likely to complete these important actions in the future. You can also build audiences, which are specific segments of users, and have AdWords display your app to them. For example, imagine that you have a group of users who are very active, have added a product to their cart, but haven't purchased yet. Well, you can use Firebase to create an audience of just these people and then use AdWords to give them specific ads and encourage them to come back to your app and take action. Understanding your users and engaging with them at just the right time and in the right way will help you build loyal users for your app. Firebase and AdWords, working together to help you grow your user base. Get started today, your new users are waiting.
Okay, so we're now in the Android sandbox area. I'm gonna spend some time in this area because there's a lot going on, but we're gonna start with just features of the OS. And uh, David here is gonna tell us about a couple things I've been really curious about. Can we start with uh, Kotlin? Let's talk about Kotlin. Sure, Kotlin is definitely the show stealer, it seems to me, from watching the uh, keynotes. So Android Studio now has Kotlin support. You can create a new project and you'll see that you have the ability to check Kotlin support in from the beginning. We already have a Kotlin app here, but you can also write Java code and convert it to Kotlin very simply. And do you like writing Kotlin? I love writing Kotlin. I actually haven't gotten a chance to write Kotlin recently, but when it was when I was first learning about it a year ago, I spent a lot of time just going through the language and getting very excited about it just because it looked so much more concise and it brings in a lot of modern features that I like from a lot of other languages. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy to see how fast they moved on it and the great tooling support that IntelliJ brought into it as well. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking to people around the festival today, and one of the things they keep saying is how well designed they believe Kotlin is and what a mature language it is because of that. Yeah, no, it's absolutely, I feel like they got a lot of influences from a lot of new languages. I highly recommend trying it out, give it a shot. And Catherine, uh, you've been working on bringing Kotlin into Android for a little while. Can you tell us uh, what the motivation for that was? Yeah, um, so I think the big reasons we wanted to bring Kotlin to Android were that, like David says, most developers who try it find it to be really concise and expressive, and it has a lot of awesome features like type and null safety, which are really useful for writing stable, non-crashy apps. Um, plus, it's totally compatible with the existing Android environment and also with the Java language which means that even if you have a large existing Android code base, it's really easy to incrementally adopt it. And you can kind of try things where it works, you don't have to go rewriting large swaths of code. That's awesome, being able to incrementally adopt it, as you were saying, so you don't have to sort of jump in and refactor everything all at once. Yeah, exactly, like if you have some chunk of Java you're happy with, you can just leave that, keep modifying it, write some new module in Kotlin, and kind of adopt it very organically you know, as you see fit. Awesome. Oh, and then I think the final thing is just, we've been hearing about from more and more developers that they love it, it really makes them happy to write in it, and you know, we try to listen to our developers and give them things they love, so hey. I want to look at something else as well, David, uh, the profiler in Android Studio. Can you show me something there? Sure, we're really excited about the profilers. I feel like this is a long time coming. If you look here, you can actually see that this is displaying bitmaps, it's a sample Android app. We downloaded it as is, we didn't modify it at all. And if you look over here, you can actually see we've already started the profilers on it. We have the CPU, memory, and network profilers. So if I start to interact with the app, you'll start to see the different profilers oh, wow. on. Yeah. So you can deep dive into any of them. Um, you can sample CPU activity. Here, we can click on some stuff. And then what you'll see is if you drag across here, you could actually look at the content of the uh, request. This is actually an HTTPS request and you can still see the contents of it, which is something that we're very excited about uh, because that was normally a challenge for a lot of people to try to do. I think some people would debug in uh, kind of HTTP traffic in order to see it, and so we've sort of enabled some new features here, which we're happy about. Oh yeah, I'm used to like inspecting the traffic on the machine that I'm testing on to try and get that debug information, and yet here it is right in studio. That's so convenient. Yeah, I really hope that people have a chance to play with it. We hope that they find the profilers intuitive, I mean, to me, what's exciting is as you're messing around with your app, you might, all of these things that were invisible before, you now have a chance to actually play around with it and see it. And as I said, we, we don't even think, we're including documentation with it, but we're even hoping that even without it, you should just be able to uh, play around and, and try things out and see what happens and then learn more about your code. We were once debugging some code and we're like, no, something's wrong here. We're getting this weird memory spike and we were actually, we were surprised to find that all along this code had a problem with it but we didn't know about it until we had written our own profilers. That's profiling. There you go. Awesome. David, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. A few people online have been asking me to get a demo of Pitcher and Pitcher. So I found Rob, and he's going to give that to us. Hey, I'm Rob from the Android Window Manager team, and I've been working on a Picture in Picture for this release. We're really excited about it because Android, you know, it's always been a good platform for interacting with content, watching YouTube, et cetera. But if you want to start to interact more deeply and multitask, we haven't always provided the tools. And I think picture in picture is a great one. So I'll walk you through a way of using it. Uh, so here we have this video, and it's a Go Game by Lisa Dole, the player who famously challenged AlphaGo. 
last year. And we can see if we go back to home, we'll get the video and it's still playing here. We can move it around. And for example, I could go into my Go app and I could start to multitask and I could play the game along. Oh, that's so cool. So that I could, uh, you know, play along with the game and begin to explore my own variations. And I can dismiss Pip when I'm done. That's awesome. That's Android Picture in Picture. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Cool, thank you. Everybody's talking about Kotlin, so I was able to get some more info out of Andre from JetBrains. Hi, Andre. Hello. So first question, you've been working with the Android team for a while. What are you most excited about with this collaboration? Well, this is very great to be here because basically this means that uh, very many people will be coming to Kotlin, new users, new, well, new exciting uh, ways of using the language, new learning materials, new libraries, everything. So it's basically Kotlin's growing as we are looking at it. And it's, it's altogether wonderful. I'm very grateful to the Android team that they had the courage to make the move. But that, that was, uh, as they say, that was what the public was actually wanting them to do. So we're very happy about it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the future and what's coming next. First, the language. What's coming next with the Kotlin language? Uh, there are actually many things we're uh, working on, but uh, so the, the brand new thing with Kotlin is coroutines. We have uh, shown the experimental design pretty, uh, yeah, it was like three, three months ago. So coroutines are a big thing now, uh, doing asynchronous programming in an easy way. So we're now looking into improving that and finalizing the design so that the next version of Kotlin will probably have it already uh, stable so everybody can use it uh, and be sure it will work for all the versions. Then the next big thing is multi-platform Kotlin. So Kotlin is now big on Android, big on the server side. Uh, we are working on JavaScript and we have recently introduced native, which is in a technical preview version now. Uh, so we're trying to span the language across many platforms and enable multi-platform development where you can say, uh, have uh, a couple of modules reused for many platforms and then some platform specific modules uh, implementing some functionality in a specific way uh, that's leveraging the intricacies of the, of the platform. So it's a very big, uh, big direction for us. And then there are uh, language only things like uh, value types, for example, for optimal storage or collection literals. So we're, we have very many directions there. Uh, and the strategic ones are those, you know, platform things and the core teams. Awesome. What about tooling? What's next there? Yeah, so uh, we are actually, JetBrains is all about tooling. So our, like, uh, first and foremost goal with Kotlin w was making the language toolable. And now we're uh, in a pretty good shape with many things, but uh, there's a long road ahead. Uh, we are now tightly integrated with Android Studio and we'll work more on that. So in uh, uh, 3.0 preview, we have new wizards for creating things and we have unified analysis for Java and Kotlin and we'll improve that. We're working on the incrementality of the tool chain. So uh, Google side as well as JetBrains side. And uh, for non-Android things, we're doing pretty much the same. We're uh, basically getting on par with Java on the uh, Java platform. We're uh, working on debuggability and incrementality for JavaScript. Native is very young for, for that, but we'll get all that there too. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you very much. The Firebase Notifications Console lets you re-engage your users quickly and easily. With it, you can manage and send notifications to your users easily with no additional coding required. Messages can be addressed to single devices, Firebase Cloud Messaging topics, or devices that you select using powerful analytics tools. So, for example, you can send a message to all of your users who have made an in-app purchase, giving them a special offer, allowing you to re-engage with them. The Firebase Notifications Console integrates with analytics so you can measure the effectiveness of your messages and explore insights based on your users' activities so you can grow your application by easily engaging your users through the Firebase Notifications Console. All right, so now we're in the Android Wear area, and we're going to take a look at some of the newest watches with the design lead from Android Wear, Brett. Hi, Brett. How you doing? Hey, Timothy. Doing great. <laughs> so I was talking to David Singleton earlier today, and he said you have to check out the new Tag Watch. Can you show it to me? Yeah, yeah, I can. So here it is. 
Um, and you can also see that it's available in you know, this diamond studded edition as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's really nice about the tag uh, connected is that it's modular and that's actually in the name. And so not only can you swap bands, but you can also swap out uh, the, the tabs on the device in addition to the bands. Whoa. So you could have like a metal bracelet band, a leather band, a sport band, as well as you can change these accents out as well. So they can be, you know, you can go for uh, same tone or, uh, uh, you know, con contrasting tone. Um, and that all snaps back together. And when it's together, it's like rock solid. Uh, so that's one ex example of how partners are really doing really interesting things in the, on the hardware side. Um, with, you know, of course, Tag, it's got all its iconic watch faces in the software, and it's, you know, all powered by the Android Wear platform. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty exciting. It was fun to be in Switzerland for the launch event for this, too. Uh, they, they know how to host. I bet they do. Um, tell me, one other thing I want to know is, uh, for developers, what's the new thing that they get to do that you're most excited about? Um, Really, I'm going to demo a different watch at that, okay. po at that point. So the best thing that developers can do now is they can start uh, powering the complication slots or developing watch faces that show off really actionable you know, and great, great information for end users. So here, um, I've got this watch face that us two developed. And it's got four slots in addition to the time. So all I have to do is long press on it. Just, you know, awesomely it's working just like it should. So I long press on it and I can change any of these slots. So I can make my, you know, next meeting. I can go and do like countdown to some uh, important upcoming date. I can show today's date. Uh, I can go and for, uh, let's see, let's change the layout you know, over to a different one so I can have like more slots. And now I can do stuff like, you know, put a fitness goal that I've set up, you know, right on my watch face with just a few taps. Whoa. And cool. so developers can do two things. They can either be the watch face itself. If, if you're a developer, you feel like you've got a really strong sense of style, um, you can develop a watch face, but you don't necessarily have to be an expert in you know, what data does the user want. You can just let the user decide. You can add these slots for complications and let data providers either from the system or from other apps uh, power them. And, that will, and the benefit to users is that they'll really like your watch face. Or if, you've, if the user's already using something like Robinhood for stocks or Google Fit for, for fitness tracking, they can get that data right on their watch face. So we're really excited about what developers are doing there and what there's still a lot of possibility left of mine. Awesome. Thanks, Seth. Sure thing, Timothy.
So, good morning. Welcome to our session on what's new in Android development tools. My name is Jamal Eason. I'm here with Zav and Tor. And today, we're going to give you an insider's tour of all the new and upcoming features for Android development. As you know, Android Studio is the official ID for developing apps for Android, provided by Google. We work hand in hand with the platform to ensure that all the latest APIs and features are tightly integrated inside of Android Studio. It's our team's mission to ensure that we provide the latest and greatest tools to help you be efficient and productive developers. I must say, I thank you for your feedback so far in making Android Studio great. So before we jump into new features, I just want to spend a few moments talking about features that we launched since we last spoke with you last year, in case you missed them. So last year at I.O., we gave you a preview of Android Studio 2.2, which included things like a new layout editor, the Expresso test recorder, and CMix support, which is great for C++ projects. And around November, we gave you a preview of Android Studio 2.3, which included things like an update to Instant Run, the lint baseline support, and the constraint layout reaching stable status, which is tightly correlated with the layout editor. And this is past March, we actually released a few releases of Android Studio 2.4. But as you know from yesterday, we're not going to be releasing Android 2.4. Instead, we're releasing Android Studio 3.0. So we made this shift for two reasons. Number one, as we were developing features, we realized all the work we were going inside this release didn't seem sort of indicative of one incremental change. Number two, we made the tough and rare decision to make a breaking Gradle API change. And we'll talk about that. But that change allows us to scale and have faster Gradle build speeds. So we have features across the entire range of feature sets for your app development, from building, testing, and optimizing your application. So let's dive in. But instead of me talking about it, I'm actually going to invite Tor up to give us a demo of all the cool features inside of Android Studio 3.0. And after that, I'll have Zach come up and talk about the build system. So with that, Tor, let's get started. All right. So this is Android Studio 3.0. Uh, it's based on the latest version of IntelliJ, a latest stable version, 2017.1. So we picked up tons of great features uh, that I'm not going to have time to show. I'll just highlight a couple. There's parameter hints, which you see here, where we show the parameter name at the call site. And there's emojis in comments. You know, so sometimes when you're commenting on some slow code, you, you really want to use a snail uh, emoticon. All right. Uh, anyway, the big news for us is that we are supporting Kotlin. So um, in the new pro yeah. So in the new project wizard, there's a checkbox now. You can enable Kotlin right from the get-go. Or in an existing project, you can start creating Kotlin files directly, and the IDE will walk you through upgrading your project dependencies. Um, or you can just take an existing class and run it through a converter. So the way you do that is you go to code, convert Java file to Kotlin file. It runs it through this converter. And sometimes it does a fantastic job. Like here, it's realized I want string interpolation, and it's used destructuring uh, declarations here. But you, know, you can see also sometimes gets warnings. Uh, it's not always perfect. I want to lower expectations a little bit. Uh, here's another example. Here we have a data class uh, in Java. There's a one-line version of this you could write in Kotlin. But if you run it through the converter, you end up with code that is completely accurate. Uh, but not the most optimal. So this does the same as before in Kotlin. Uh, so it's really a great starting point, And then typically, you massage it a bit more. Uh, so here's a, a Kotlin file showing several language features. You have you know, the for, uh, for loop with ranges. You have a let statement with a lambda. And you have a when statement. We don't have time to cover the language today. There's going to be uh, talks about that tomorrow that you don't want to miss. Um, but when you're starting out, you might have some concerns about performance here. You know, like, is this going to be expensive? What about this let statement? Is this making a new inner class and an object? There's a really great way to find out. So you can invoke the show bytecode uh, window. This is going to show the bytecode for the current statement. Uh, if you read bytecode, that's great. But if you don't, there's this really great decompile button in the top right window here. When I click on this, I get the equivalent Java code. So now I can look at this and go, OK, that range loop turns into a really pure while loop with an index check. And similarly, the let statement is just you know, uh, an if check. So don't 
prematurely optimize in your head based on what you are afraid Kotlin's going to do, right? You know, the most beautiful Kotlin code you can, and when you're in doubt, you can check what it's doing. The last thing I'm going to say about Kotlin is that uh, all the uh, Android lint checks that ran on Java files, there's about 80 of those, uh, they're all running on Kotlin as well. There's no gap. It's the same code base now. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the layout editor. So uh, we launched the new layout editor last year at I.O., and we've continued working on it, obviously. Uh, so one of the things we have in the new version is better handling of errors, as you can see here, uh, and constraint layout. We've enhanced that a lot. So uh, first of all, we recently added chains. So a chain is a way to distribute widgets along an axis. So you can select these three widgets, say that I want to create, for example, a horizontal chain. I don't know if you can see, but there's kind of a beautiful chain graphic here. Um, and I can align this uh, horizontally. And now there's this chain cycle button. So I can basically click on this to explore how the chains are behaving. Another, ex uh, another feature we're about to launch is constraint layout 1.1. And in 1.1, we have uh, barriers. And the easiest way to explain this is just to show it, I think. Uh, and so if I were to move this widget, you can see that this line next to it, basically, uh, we make sure that we don't ever overlap with it. So this is a pretty good way to make layouts that respond correctly. Uh, and that's actually all I'm going to say about constraint layout, because there's a whole talk about it in a couple, of, a couple of hours that you don't want to miss. Another feature we've added in the layout editor is um, support for sample data. So in your apps, you might have a list view or a recycler view. It's pretty common. Uh, and it looks nothing like the layout editor when you run, because you're putting data into it, images uh, and, of course, uh, application-specific data. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we added some support to deal with this with design time attributes, the tools attributes, right? So you could put some string in, and you can start approximating what your app's going to do. But that's terrible in a list view. So <clears throat> we've continued enhancing this. So now we have this new sample resource type. Uh, so for example, I can, pull, I can pull in some lorem ipsum text, or I can pull in, uh, let's say, a date of the week. But the real power of this is when you actually define your own data. So here is this new JSON file that I've created in my project. This is for a fitness app. So there's various activities that you know, this app is modeling, biking, walking, and so forth. And there's some other data associated, like distances. And we even have some icons. What I can do now is go into my item layout that I'm using in the list. And I can start binding these things. So code completion works here for the at sample tag. It's picking out all the attributes from the JSON file. And I can, for example, hook up the, you know, the icon property to this. I can hook up the description property to this next text view. And so when I come back to this, you can see I get a layout that looks much more like the real app. <laughs> all right. The last layout editor feature I'm going to show is uh, support for O uh, downloadable fonts. So in O, you can declare down, downloadable fonts. There's lots of advantages, and there's a talk about that as well, of course. Uh, but the way this works is that I select uh, a text view, and in the layout editor, in the font family uh, chooser, there's a more fonts item on the bottom. When I invoke that, I can browse the available online uh, fonts or search. I'm going to pick my favorite, finger paint. Uh, and you can see I now get this new font resource in my project, and you know, it actually works. Uh, the way you'd expect. All right, another O feature we've added is support for adaptive icons. So in the image asset wizard, we now help you create these. So we help you with the foreground layer. You can uh, modify the background layer. Uh, I don't know if you can tell from the screen, but there's also options to show safe zones, grid, and so forth. So this hopefully helps you put all the right bits in the right places. Another uh, small feature that's easy to miss is the bottom right corner here. There's a device explorer now, finally. Uh, so here you can go in and actually explore files on your file system. You know, you can click on files to see them locally. Uh, and you can right click on folders to upload and download files and that kind of thing. All right, let's talk about, thank you. Let's talk about instant apps. So we have a lot of support for instant apps. We have a bunch of new lint rules. We have support in the Gradle build system, which I think Zav will talk about. Uh, we have new wizards for creating uh, feature modules. Uh, but the hardest part of creating an instant app is probably going to be to break up your monolithic app. 
So we're working on some refactoring tools to help with that. So I'm going to take this simple example first. So here I have a class. I'm going to extract it. So I invoke the modularized refactoring. And you can see that it offers to pull four classes out into this new module. And that's because this class depends on three other classes recursively. Uh, and it'll also pull along with it resources and manifest entries. This is the ideal case that I bet you will not actually encounter with your own app. Uh, here's a more realistic example. So I'm going to try to pull this activity into its own module. And here you can see it's pulling a lot. And we have some spaghetti because my class depends on this class, which then, you know, utils class, which is then pointing it to some other stuff. This is real spaghetti. And so what you have to do now is start deciding where to cut the spaghetti, right? Uh, and so you invoke this, it creates a new code, and then you would have to actually fix the code afterwards. Uh, so this, we have an initial version of this in Canary 1, but this is a feature we're ver very much still working on. We've also uh, improved the APK analyzer. So uh, what I can do here is load in a uh, APK that is a release binary. Right? So last year, we launched this, and we had a lot of support for resources. This year, we've added a bunch of support for, for uh, code and DEX. So first of all, I can drill into the DEX system here. Um, let's see. So I can right click on a class. And we disassemble the bytecode for you. You can also notice that the package name here is a.a.a. .a .a, and I promise we didn't write the code that way. That's because this is a ProGuarded APK, right? So ProGuard has gone and, and shrunk all the symbols down to something very short. But now we have this button for loading the ProGuard mapping file. So when I do that, I've got to find my ProGuard mapping file. When I do that, you can see that we now show the original symbol names instead as you're drilling around on the DEX file, which is pretty handy. <laughs> there are some more features here. I can right click and, for example, generate a keep rule, which is handy when I'm comparing debug and release binaries. By the way, we have this compare button up here on the right. Uh, and I notice that, hey, I need to actually keep this class for the release. Or conversely, I might be surprised that this class is in the release binary. And so I can right click and say, show me the usages in the ProGuarded code uh, to help me identify what it is I need to get rid of. We have another feature for APKs, and that is APK debugging. So the way this works is that either from the welcome screen or from the file menu here, you can point to a random APK. Let's see. I don't know why it's not showing my home folder. I think I'm having network issues. Well, this is very sad. All right, I'm just going to talk through it. So basically, if you're not using Studio, if you're a game developer, we give you a way to just point to an APK. And we make a shell project for you based on the APK analyzer, where we show you the sources inside the APK on the left. Uh, and then we let you map sources, the Java source code, as well as the shared libraries. We, we let you drop in a SO with debuggable symbols to stand in place for the optimized one. So uh, I'm really sad that didn't work. All right, uh, next, I should talk about the profiler. Uh, this is a really, really big feature for us with lots of people working on it. Uh, and here's how it works. So I'm, I've already started running my app. It's an image app. In fact, you probably saw this in the keynote. I started running it. And so the way the profiler works is I can now open up the profiler tab. And it will attach to the process. All right, no connected devices. I'm going to run it again. It's very unhappy. I'm going to just kill the emulator and start over. This is really exciting television, isn't it? All right. Uh, we should work on making that system image boot faster. <laughs> All right. So here we have it. Uh, and no connected devices. Wow. <laughs> you know what? I say we, uh... oh, there we go. Here we go. Whew. All right. Uh, OK, so the way this works is that it's attached to this process. And it's showing, showing me what's happening with the CPU, memory, and network. 
Uh, and so let's go and uh, make some stuff happen in the app, right? So I'll click on an image. And wow, uh, network is very unhappy. OK. All right. Super slow. OK. Anyway, it works. Because if we look in the background here, and I accidentally clicked on the memory profiler, here we have the CPU, memory, and network. Do you see these little uh, purple dots up here? Those are my touch events. You can also see the activities happening, uh, activity uh, things like stopped and destroyed. It's very small. But it's, it's basically listing activity names up here. So uh, let's start with the network. This is a timeline I can scroll in. So I'm going to click down in the network area. And here I can see the network traffic and radio traffic that happened in this time interval. I can zoom in on something like this, and it'll show me the network calls that happened during that time. And I can click on a particular network request and sort of see it and the call stack. And the way this works is that we instrument your app at build time. Uh, and so you have to opt, uh, opt into this. So you go to your run config, and there's a profiling tab where you enable advanced profiling. So uh, basically, we look for uses of, usages of HTTP URL connection. Uh, and so if your app is using that or anything based on it, like Volley, uh, and we also support OK HTTP now as of 3.0 Canary 1. <laughs> We've also added support in Android O for, um, for basically doing this instrumentation on the fly. So you don't need to do any kind of build time instrumentation. So uh, that'll be enabled in an upcoming build of Android Studio. All right, so that's the network profiler. Let's look at the CPU profiler. All right, so I'm going to, again, click in here. And, and here I can see the thread activity. So I'm going to jump to be live again. Uh, and then I'm going to do some stuff in the app. So I'll click on this image. Actually, I forgot that I, what I want to do is start collecting samples. So I'm clicking on the recording. And now it's gathering more information. And then I'll do some stuff in the app like that. And now I'll stop recording. OK, so now the timeline is showing me here that during this interval, we, had, we have more information. And I can stop. I can uh, click on a particular thread I'm interested in. So the thread displays in the middle here. And we can see that async task 3 looks pretty interesting. So I'll click on that. You can see a flame chart on the bottom here. And this is actually based on ranges that I select. Right? So I can, I can narrow my focus on what I'm particularly interested in. And we also have you know, a, uh, actually, that was the call chart. This is the flame chart. And we also have top down and bottom up uh, displays of the frames. So here I can sort in descending order of uh, method calls, for example. So that's the CPU profiler. And last but not least, we have the network profiler. So again, I'm going to go live. So I just want to reiterate this point about this timeline keeping all data. I think I was told about 5 megabytes per hour is what this costs. Uh, so now I'm going to go live. And we're going to start looking at memory. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to go inside the app, and I'm going to ask it to clear all of its caches. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the network profiler. And I'm going to click on the garbage collection. So now we have sort of a good baseline. All right. So this is showing you the memory of the app right now. And let's start collecting allocation stack traces. This means that any kind of allocation that happens in the app, we're going to record where it was done. And the reason for that will be obvious in a second. And now I'm going to do some more uh, memory intensive activities in the app. You can see in the background, the metrics are scrolling as it's realizing the heap is larger. Uh, and now let's go in and grab a heap dump with this down area here. So now it's fetching a heap dump. And that should be fast. Yeah. So here we can see basically a summary of the objects in the heap. Uh, if I click on, for example, the bitmap class, there's 76 bitmaps. I can see those objects here. I can click on a bitmap class. And just like in the old heap viewer, I can now start chasing down the references if I, if I want to look for a leak. But I can also see which bitmap this is. Or if this was allocated during my allocation tracking run, I can see the allocation stack trace, where this object came from. Uh, and for other classes, for example, string, yes, we show the actual string. So uh, that's the new profiler. We hope it makes your apps better. <laughs> and now I'm going to turn it over to Zav, who's going to show you how we're working to make your builds perform faster. Thank you, Toh.
All right, let's start with our new Maven repository. Uh, finally, I know a lot of people ask for it. Uh, so the URL is maven.google.com. And starting with Gradle uh, 4.0 Milestone 2 that was released yesterday, you can just use the Google shortcut so it's much easier and you don't have to remember the URL. Uh, we are publishing all those support libraries and the Gradle plugin now exclusively through the repository. And we've uploaded all the previous version uh, of the support library, not of the Gradle plugin yet. That will come soon. Uh, so you can just start using the repository even if you're not using the new uh, artifact that we released yesterday. Uh, then let's talk about build performance. We know it's a, it's a big problem for a lot of developers. And we spent uh, the last few quarters really focusing on that a lot. So uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, making a lot of tasks more incremental. So we, took at, we looked at the biggest tasks that takes the longest to run, and we looked at what we could do to make them incremental. Um, so the Java compilation is actually part of Gradle itself. And as of Gradle 3.5, it's enabled uh, by default, and it's you know, stable incremental compilation. Uh, it doesn't yet support annotation processor, but it's something that we're working with the Gradle team to fix. Uh, dexing uh, in the plugin 3.0 is uh, incremental on a per class basis and works with mul uh, legacy multidex as well. So that will make a big difference. Uh, and then finally, APK packaging uh, in 2.2, we, we released that as an uh, incremental uh, packager so that we don't have to recompress entries that you know, didn't change from the previous build. Um, and then we have a couple of tasks like resource processing. We are working on it uh, using APT2. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. We're planning to release that for 3.0, for the final 3.0. And then uh, shrinking, if you're using shrinking uh, in your debug build in order to get below the multidex limit, we have an incremental uh, shrinker that allows predexing and is faster than just running ProGuard. So you can use that just for debug and do obfuscation with ProGuard in release. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about is the build cache. So Gradle in 3.5 release a uh, build cache that works at the task level. So Gradle already looks at the hash of all your inputs and to see if the task is up to date or not. And now you can use that hash as a key in the cache. And if the task needs to run, but there's an entry in the cache, you're just going to get the uh, output directly from the cache rather than rerun the task. So it will be faster. Uh, it should be stable in Gradle 4.2 and enabled by default at that point. Um, there's two different versions of the task, the first one is, uh, of the cache, sorry. The first one is local, so it's good when you're switching between branches, and you can enable it today with uh, Gradle 4.0 uh, using dash dash build cache or the property. And then the other one is the distributed one, uh, you know, sharing build cache with your teammate and your build server. Uh, for that, you need a storage backend, so they have a uh, reference implementation on top of Hazelcast that you can use. Uh, Gradle Enterprise, of course, supports it, and there's a very simple API if you want to generate your own backend. Uh, so the Gradle plugin uh, 3.0 Alpha 1 does not have a lot of cache that are right now marked as cacheable, only a couple of them. But we are planning to roll out more of those, and most of them by the time uh, 3.0 is final. So that should make a big improvement. Now, a lot of developers are asking us, OK, how should I organize my project? You know, how many, component, uh, how many modules, and how does that affect performance? So generally, more modules mean you can go around you know, lack of incrementity in, so, in some of the tasks. Uh, but it's also useful for other things, like you know, code reuse, for example, um, you know, if you want to share code across different applications. If you want to have better control over API and dependencies, like your business logic should probably not have access to some random UI framework that you're using. Right? But in terms of performance, uh, with caching in particular, then having more modules means more chance to have a cache hit, and that's better. And also, there's something called compilation avoidance that was introduced in Gradle uh, 3.4 that we're now using. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. James and Jerome have a talk today at 5.30 uh, talking about building up um, speed, uh, build speed, and they'll talk about it at that point. Now, we know that a lot of developers have told us, well, I'm adding more modules, and now my build is a lot slower. You know, what gives? Uh, so this is really what we focused on a lot in, in 3.0, so I want to talk about that now. Uh, the first thing that we looked at was the startup cost of the build, right? The, that configuration time that happens every time you want to do a build or every time you want to sync. So we got a project from a developer. Uh, it's about 135 modules, 220 dependencies. And in 2.2, it took almost three minutes to configure, and that's pretty terrible. So we finally fixed that down to 10 seconds in 2.3. But even then, we are still doing things that we shouldn't be doing, like resolving dependencies for all the variants, even though you may only build one of them. Uh, and we couldn't really fix it properly without a lot of new APIs. So in, in 3.0, with Gradle 4.0, we finally fixed that, and it's down to two seconds. Uh, we still have some room for improvement. Uh, there are some things that are not quite parallelized, but uh, we'll, we'll do that later. 
so um, the other thing that we looked at was you know, bottleneck when you have a lot of modules and you want to parallelize the build. And again, it's something we work very closely with the Gradle team. They did a lot of new APIs for us, and finally, we can fix that. So let's look at an example here. Uh, here on the left, we have some tasks that belong to an app that consumes a library, and the tasks are on the right. So let's go through what happened in the build. And you know, we're going to basically build all the elements of the app, of the library, and then package them in a big zip file, the AR. And then we're going to unzip that AR, and we're going to consume it you know, on the app. So you can see zero parallelism. Uh, that's pretty terrible. So again, with those new APIs that we have, now we can publish uh, all those elements of the AR, and there's about like 14 of them, uh, separately instead of just having to publish the full AR. And the build instead can look something like that. As soon as the manifest of the library is, used, uh, is available, we can keep building the library, but we can start building the app too. And then you have better parallelism. And notice also that we don't build the AR at all anymore. We don't unzip it, so the build is also more efficient that way. And then finally, Gradle for Lodo has some additional APIs to do uh, parallelism inside a single module. We're not quite using them yet, but we're going to start using them soon. All right, let's talk about some new build features. Oh, and I want to mention that you know, it, it's just a first step, right? We're not saying we're going to. 3.0 is going to fix everything, right? It's something we're going to keep investing a lot in, and it's just like a first step. OK, so some new build features. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is Java 8 language features. Um, so it used to require Jack. We announced a few weeks ago that Jack is deprecated. In fact, in 3.0, Jack is completely removed. If you try to enable it, it will tell you, don't enable it. Uh, the DSL is still there so that we have a proper message. All you have to set up is the source compatibility and the target compatibility. So the uh, build looks something like this, right? We go from Java C, which generates Java 8 class byte code, to a converter that converts that to Java 7 class byte code, transform, and then indexing. The transform is things like ProGuard, Instant Run, but also your own transforms. Potentially, if you use the transform API. So just as a heads up, uh, later, probably in 3.1, we're going to reverse those two steps and do the conversion after. So if you have custom transform, you need to update them to Java 8 class byte code as soon as possible. Uh, the second uh, feature I want to talk about is dependency management. So there's a lot of changes here in 3.0. Um, you're probably aware that if you have an app and a library right now, um, the, library, you know, the, the app only consumes the release version of the library always. Uh, so on the right here, you have the configuration of the library, debug and release, and then you have the configuration of the app, debug and release, and then compile and packaging. And you could kind of like go around that by manually setting up you know, debug compile and then targeting debug. and that would work, but if you use Flavor, it doesn't quite work very well. Now, in 3.0, things are more complicated because for compilation avoidance, what we have on the library side is we publish two configuration per variant. So now we have debug API element and debug runtime that are meant to be used on the other side by compile and runtime, which were renamed to match the greater ones. So the good news is that we finally fixed that in 3.0, uh, thanks to new API in Gradle, and now the stuff goes automatically. We don't have to manually try to, to make that work. So let's look to see how that works at a high level. Basically, we have the ability to set up attributes on uh, this configuration object, and Gradle will automatically match them. So we create an attribute on build type for you automatically, and then debug matches uh, debug, and then release matches release. Uh, if you have flavors, same thing, right? We create a new attribute for the flavor, and then you know, blue debug matches with blue debug automatically. You, know, you don't have anything to do. It's done automatically. Now, of course, if you don't have the same number of flavor everywhere, uh, it's going to work too. Like if you don't have them in the library, uh, blue debug is going to match with de debug automatically. Uh, the attributes are actually optional. Uh, however, it's that, it's, that's the other way around. If you have a library with flavors, but you don't have flavor in an application, then it's just not going to work, and you're going to get a build error, and you have to fix it. So we have a new DSL. It's called flavor selection. It's not variant aware yet, but we're going to do that where you basically tell the build, look, I want to pick blue instead of you know, orange. And then it just works. Um, now, if you switch to 3.0 and you have flavors, you're very likely to run into that error saying, you know, hey, flavor and dimension name is now required, which you may already be doing with two different ones, but not if you have a, a single uh, dimension. So fixing it is very easy, right? You know, you have, that's your code, roughly. Uh, and then you fix it with that, and that's done. You, you don't actually need to put it in like flavor one or flavor two block, because there's only one dimension. We can just fix that for you. Uh, so the big question is, why do we force you to do that? Why can't we just pick up a random default value? So let's go through an example. Here we have an app, and the app requires a debug orange. And then we have two libraries, one of them with two flavors, blue and orange, and the one with strawberry and orange. Now, you can already see that's not quite the same orange, right? And we, we just don't know. So when the app says orange, it's like, I don't know which orange you want. 
So that's why we ask you to name those flavor dimension, because we're going to use that as the name of the attribute. And then the name of the attribute is actually you know, color blue, color orange, and then fruit, strawberry. And then we can make the right selection. And it's the same thing, right? Here, to make it work, you have to set a flavor selection. And in order to do that, you need to not just give us blue, but you need to give us color blue so that we can properly set that new attribute uh, on the uh, configuration. And then it just works out of the box. OK, uh, let's talk about Instant App a little bit. So let's say you have an app. Uh, you know, it has a few modules, an app module with that, the uh, application module, some library module. Um, and then you want to make some of those libraries as feature for your Instant App. So the first thing you're going to do is change some of those plugins to be not library, but be feature. It's a new plugin that we released. It's part of 3.0, right? And what's nice about that feature plugin is that it uses the attribute mechanism I just talked about so that it publishes both a AR, or at least the content of the AR, for an app, and a feature APK. So when an app says, hey, you know, I depend on you. Give me your artifact, it adds to the attribute saying, I'm an app. And then it's going to link it to the right configuration, and it's going to consume the feature plugin or, you know, as an AR. And when you have another module that is um, an instant app, and the, the goal of that instant app module is not to build anything, it's just to package, to grab all of the feature APK and make it into a bundle that can be uploaded to a phone or to the Play Store, uh, then the feature plugin will actually build a feature APK, something that can actually be distributed to your phone as an you know, instant app feature. And, uh, and that way, you can really share code without having to do some weird stuff. It's just the regular module that you have before. Just change the plugin, and that's it. If you want more information about building Android apps, uh, there's a talk at 3.30 today uh, that I encourage you to watch. And with that, back to Jamal. All right, so test. So now you've developed and built your application. Now it's time to test. So what we offer inside of Android Studio is a new performant Android emulator, which we actually released about a year and a half ago. So if you haven't tried it since then, I highly encourage it. It's fast and exciting. But after launching the Android emulator, we found about two pain points from developers. One, developers want to try out their end-to-end -end flow. What's the experience look like, for instance, when my, app my, 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 my user actually downloads my app? Or perhaps, what's the experience of an in-app purchase? There is no way to test this. The second pain point was around Google Play services. It seemed every release, there was some lag between the Google Play services and the Android emulator. So to that, we added the Google Play Store to the emulator. Now, this seemingly small step was actually a lot of work. What we did was actually add a lot of quality and performance enhancements to ensure we had a great experience when using the Play Store with the emulator. Along with that, we also added support for OpenGL ES 3.0 which hopefully will help you accelerate your testing as well. And lastly, we added proxy support. I know some of you have enterprise networks, our unique HTT support. Now we have a UI system that manages that. So I want to talk about the impact and implications of adding the Play Store. So we've always shipped the AOSP versions, or the Android open source project versions of the system images. What this allows you to do is have unfettered access to both the operating system and your app by having elevator privileges and root access. But by adding the Google Play Store, we actually have a new variation of this called the Google Play Edition. And what this means is now we actually digitally sign the system images. But that prevents you from having root access. So if you want Google Play and Google APIs, just use the Google Play Edition. But if you want the deep analysis and root access ability, you still have the AOSP version that's also available. One additional thing I want to talk about for the emulator is actually this new app bug reporting system. So we heard from some of you like, hey, I want to have a quick way to take a bug report. So perhaps I can share with my colleague and my QA team. So now, with one, two clicks, you can create a bug report for your emulator, take a screenshot, have some space to do a repo step, and, and put that to your QA team. So that should make it quicker for you to do development on the emulator. Lastly, for those of you who do Android Wear development, as you heard with Android Wear 2.0, we now support devices with rotary support. So we added a feature inside the emulator for you now to test that all inside the Android emulator. And lastly, about debugging, it's around Layout Inspector. So as you saw from Tor's demo, we have a rich new layout editor, which allows you to add new constraint layouts and new themes and styles for your application. But many times, you might have a problem with your layout. Something's the wrong color, or something's invisible or gone. So we actually launched a Layout Inspector last year. But with this release, we added new capability for better search and better organization properties to help debug your layouts for your Android app. So lastly, optimize. 
So as you heard during the keynote, we talked about Android Vitals. And what this really is about is about the system health about your phone and the apps on it. And the way we think about this is actually sort of a continuum of information that's available. So as you get system health information now available through the Google Play Console or Firebase, now you have a list of sort of, a, a sort of symptoms of what might be going on through your application. And now you can pop into Android Studio to have a deeper understanding of what's going on and have that root case analysis. And as Tor showed you, at the core of this is the Android profiler. So I hope you take advantage of all these various tools to understand, ranging from, again, the CPU profiler to understand what's going on with your CPU, the memory usage to understand what's going on with your memory profiler of your application, and lastly, the network profiler to get a deeper understanding of what's going on with your network traffic of your app. The last topic I want to talk about and optimize is around APK size. So as you heard on the keynote yesterday, we, we announced Android Go, and this initiative around make, making Android optimal and smaller. So many times through your APK, you might have legacy code or things going on with it you may not sort of remember putting into the app. So with 3.0, as Tor demonstrated, we've add, now added additional capability into the KPA analyzer. So again, I invite you to use this in your typical optimization flow. As demonstrated, we added support for instant apps, better bytecode support, program file mapping, and much more. And lastly, I want to call out a big feature around vector assets. So I'm a big fan of using vector assets myself, and it's a great way to optimize your application. But if you must use a bitmap or a raster image, we added WebP support inside of Android Studio. And what we found is if you convert from PNG to JPEG, you can save upwards to 25% in your file size, which can be a huge saving for your ABK. So again, if you right click on any PNG asset inside of our JPEG inside of Android Studio, you'll auto convert it to WebP. And if you want to edit it, you can actually convert your WebP back into PNG. And with that, that's Android Studio. So we talked about a range of features from develop for adding Kotlin support, or better Java 8 language support, better instant one support inside the build system, adding the Google Play Store to the emulator, and a whole suite of optimization tools for you. And with that, that's our talk. Thank you so much. Welcome, friends. Today we have with us Preeti Guruswami to share her journey as a woman in tech. Preeti, how did you get started with programming? I don't come from a CS background. I come from a biotechnology background. I wanted to be in medicine. Unfortunately, because of financial situation, I couldn't get into medicines. So a lot of people said, why not try IT? Started as a software tester and something caught me. <laughs> After a year, I wanted to do programming, and I remember my mentor, she asked me, have you programmed? I said, no. Will you do it? She asked me, and I said, yes. <laughs> Preeti, you've been involved in many communities. What is the one thing that keeps you motivated to contribute back to the society? I feel women need a lot of empowerment and uh, even as a child, right, if, uh, whenever there used to be a maid and their daughters, I used to always sit with them and teach them so that, okay, do something uh, as an education because education is a very important part of it. And mostly you are educated because you need to have a good husband. Otherwise, if you are less educated, you may not get a very... <laughs> I think that's why mostly all of us are educated, at least my cousin clan were we are all educated because we get a good husband and I was not very keen about uh, not getting good husband because I never thought education is for a husband, right? Education was for self. What is the message that you would like to give to the women out there who want to start mentoring other women? I think first thing, whether you want to be a mentor or not, you need to believe in yourself and move forward. I think most of the time we don't believe in ourselves, right? And Mentoring is a, one of the beautiful concepts that has been in India. We call guru, we had gurus before, they were all mentors. Unfortunately, we have forgotten that fact, right? And being a mentor, you will learn a lot. So be truthful, be sincere and tell your experience in a very sincere way. You know, uh, you don't know who will be inspired by you 
who will learn from you you don't know you they might learn or they may not learn but at least you will carve a path for somebody and definitely you will be a good mentor thanks a lot preeti and you have a great story to share thank you so much it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much welcome everyone we have with us soham mondel today who is a google developer expert for user experience soham what is ux according to you so ux is as you know right user experience it's about understanding the need uh, the basic goal that they want to achieve and helping them achieve that goal as simple as that recently our app got featured on the play store so what are your tips for other app developers So the first thing is uh, do a lot of user research understand their backgrounds and motivations why they are installing your app in the first place and then build something for that uh, after that once you've understood that you've tested that done some usability testing then follow guidelines right guidelines make your life easier um follow material design guidelines and other guidelines that's how my app got featured in the play store what are the tips you would like to give for people who are building for rural india the challenges in rural india are completely different Uh, you have to first of all localize the application right uh, there are so many languages in india it's very important that you localize the app and make it very very accessible uh, apart from that make sure that the gestures and icons and the overall application is very very uh, localized so people are not used to swiping because that's their first computing device so make sure that you are uh, building something that they understand and finally make sure that you're doing usability testing that they are able to achieve the task right in any kind of application that's very very important so with all of this you i'm sure you'll be able to make a great application for for the whole of india you are a blr droid community organizer what is it that motivates you to give your skills and expertise back to the community i've been part of this community for uh, you know since 2009 and um, you know initially i was just a member i used to go to meetups i used to learn so much used to meet so many interesting people such a great experience that you learn something you meet people and then you want to kind of give back to it because um, it's so good i've learned so much from it it's only fair that i give it back so that's that's my motivation whether you're just starting out on your journey toward a career in android development or you've been working as an android developer for some time you might ask yourself how can i separate myself from the pack and get recognized introducing the associate android developer certification by google an achievement available to those who can display the skills of an entry level android developer the first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam start by learning what the exam covers review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam next decide whether you need training or are ready to take the exam training is available online as well as in person also training is available in some colleges and universities when you're ready sign up and take the exam As part of the sign up, you will pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you will pay 6500 rupee. If you live outside of India, you will pay $149 US. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you will download the exam and load it into Android Studio and begin. The exam is a timed performance-based assessment in which you will implement new features and debug issues in an existing app. When you start the exam, you'll have 48 hours to finish. And once you are done, you will submit the exam for grading. Your submission will be evaluated through a combination of machine and human grading. Based on the outcome of machine grading, you will move on to the exit interview. After you've finished and you've passed your interview, you will then receive a mark from Google and join our community of Google certified associate Android developers. Once you're certified, You can share your mark on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. Every time your mobile app crashes, it's an invitation to your users to rate it poorly and uninstall it. This can spell disaster for the new app that you just launched. If you're an app developer, you need to know exactly where your app is having problems, and you need this information quickly so you can correct the issue before it affects too many of your users. This is where Firebase Crash Reporting can help. Our crash reporting tool collects information about crashes that your users are experiencing and sends that data as quickly as possible to be tracked in your dashboard. With the dashboard, you can monitor the overall health of your app. Here, you can see the top crashes and track the recent history of crashes in your app. 
Crashes are grouped by similarity and ordered by the severity of impact on your users, so you always know which issues to address first in order to best increase the quality of your app. Each instance of a crash comes with detailed information surrounding its circumstances, including the stack trace, device type, and other important details about the device at the moment of the crash. To further enhance these details, you can log additional information as the app is running. All recent log messages are captured for every crash to help your diagnosis. In the event that you're able to handle and recover from an error in your code, but want to report that event for analysis as well, there's an API to send these non-fatal errors for display in the dashboard. It's easy to get started with Firebase crash reporting. On Android, the SDK is enabled simply by integrating the Firebase Gradle plugin into your build with no additional lines of code required. And on iOS, there's a CocoaPod, which requires a few lines of code for initialization when the app launches. To learn more and get started with Firebase crash reporting today, be sure to start with the documentation available right here. We can't help you write perfect code, but we can help you fight fires with Firebase. Launching a great app requires dedication and vision, but growing one takes revenue. How about a monetization solution tailored specifically to your app? One that has rich and engaging ads? One that works with Firebase to give you the insights you need to grow? And one that uses mediation to connect you with networks all over the world? Well, that solution is AdMob. Trusted by more than one million apps, AdMob offers developers everything they need to implement first-class monetization strategies. And when paired with Firebase, it's even better. AdMob is included with the Firebase SDK, and its APIs are built to make adding banners, interstitials, and video ads to your app simple. Plus, AdMob automatically selects the ads that pay you the most, so you can sit back and watch your revenue grow. And as your business grows, you can benefit from AdMob's advanced features. Say version 2 of your app has a slick new design, and now you need an ad format that fits naturally with your content. With AdMob's native ads, you can create CSS templates designed specifically for your user experience. We'll style the ads to match and display the result in a native ad view that fits your app like they were made for each other. And it doesn't stop there. AdMob helps you earn in-app purchase revenue too. AdMob can determine which of your users is most likely to make a purchase and target those people. They'll see an ad you design and they can make purchases right there. Now, with your app's slick design and in-app products, it's become a worldwide sensation. But how can you make sure you're maximizing the revenue generated by each user? With AdMob, you can connect to ad networks around the world, bringing even more advertisers who will compete for your impressions. And because you're using Firebase, you get access to free and unlimited analytics. Imagine a big-time blogger in Tokyo posts about your app, and overnight, your Japanese audience quadruples. With Firebase Analytics, you can easily spot the trend and then switch to your AdMob settings to tweak mediation configurations or start a campaign targeting your new fans. That's AdMob with Firebase. It's as easy as you want and as powerful as you need. Analytics. We all know they're important to building a successful app which is why there are many different kinds of analytics tools for app developers to use. There are in-app behavioral analytics, which measure who your users are, what they're doing, and so on. And then you've got attribution analytics, which you can use to measure the effectiveness of your advertising and other growth campaigns, not to mention push notification analytics and crash reporting. But quite often, this work is being done by completely different analytics libraries, which means you've got reports living in various tools across the web and trying to understand trends across these different reports, much less get them to talk to each other, isn't always easy. That's why we've created Firebase Analytics. Firebase Analytics is built from the ground up to provide all the data that mobile app developers need in one easy place. And it starts by giving you free and unlimited logging and reporting. That's right, no quotas, no sampling, and no paid tier to worry about. Simply by installing the Firebase SDK, Analytics automatically starts providing insight into your app. You receive demographic information on who your users are, how regularly they visit your app, how much time they've spent using it, and how much money they've spent in your app. But not all apps are alike, and you can get detailed information about what your users are up to by logging events specific to your app. These can include common events that Firebase Analytics has already defined, like when your users add an item to their cart, and there's also support for custom events you create yourself, like when a user completes a workout in your fitness app or when they take a selfie in your photo app. Jeez. 
But it's not just about seeing what your users are doing. It's also about discovering who your users are. So in addition to demographic information, you can also discover how your different groups of users behave by setting custom user properties. Have a music app and want to find out whether your classical music fans are browsing more albums than your jazz fusion fans? That's the kind of data you can easily break out thanks to custom user properties. And Firebase Analytics doesn't just measure what's happening inside your app, it lets you combine your behavioral reporting, what your users are doing, with attribution reporting, or what growth campaigns are bringing people to your app in the first place. So if you want to know which ad campaigns are bringing you the users who spend the most money, or are sharing the app with their friends, or have unlocked the last level in your game and are ready for the sequel, you can do all of that in Firebase Analytics. But don't stop there. Once you have all this information, you can take action on it using Firebase Analytics audiences. Firebase Analytics gives you the power to build up groups of users, or audiences, out of just about anything you can measure in your app. Want to target users in Brazil who have visited the sports section of your in-app store? It's as easy as a few clicks in the Firebase console. Once your app has built up this audience, you can send them notifications using Firebase notifications, or you can modify their in-app experience using Firebase Remote Config, or you can target them through AdWords, Google's ad platform. And then, because that impact can be measured using Firebase Analytics, you can confirm you're getting the outcomes you expect. Firebase Analytics already comes with a dashboard that lets you view answers for common questions. But if you need more specialized analysis, you can export all of your data into BigQuery, Google's data warehouse in the cloud, where you can run super fast SQL queries to slice and dice this data however you'd like. You can even combine it with other analytics data that you might be capturing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what Firebase Analytics can do for you. To find out more, check out our documentation here and give Firebase Analytics a try. We are in the era of progressive web apps. Browsers are more performant and capable than ever, and front-end JavaScript frameworks like Angular and Polymer have simplified development of rich app-like websites. You can now build an entire application purely with static files like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Firebase hosting is tailored for front-end web applications. Firebase Hosting is a developer-focused static web hosting provider that is fast, secure, and reliable. No matter where a user is, the content is delivered fast. Files deployed to Firebase Hosting are cached on SSDs at CDN Edge servers around the world. From San Francisco to Stockholm to Seoul, your users get a reliable, low-latency experience. And every site is served over a secure connection. Firebase Hosting automatically provisions and configures an SSL certificate for each site deployed, so you can get that green lock of confidence. Deploying your app from a local directory to the web only takes one command. So whether you're building a single page web app, a mobile app landing page, or a progressive web app, Firebase Hosting has you covered. To get started with Firebase Hosting, check out our quick start to get you up and running in minutes. Happy deploying! So here we are on Main Street. It's pretty much the main thoroughfare at Google I.O. 2017. I figured I'd just take a stroll and see what's going on. Want to come with me? <laughs> OK. Hi, everybody. Enjoying the festival? OK, good. So apparently, this is an AR, augmented reality, for those paying attention. Wall. I haven't gotten uh, oh, oh, figured out how to do it just yet, though. Maybe it's over this way. <laughs> it's just one of the many things that you can do here in between the sessions. I believe this is dancing, right? So let's go over here. So one of the cooler things that I found here on Main Street is the opportunity to send a postcard, well, to anybody. I'm choosing to send it to future Timothy. Shall we write me a few notes? OK. Hey. Hi. I'm going to join you all here and write a postcard. What, uh, who'd you write? Um, I'm writing back home to Georgia, the country. <laughs> yes. Quite far. So let's see how long it takes to get there. I, uh, we'll find out. I'm sending mine to future Timothy. Oh, wow. Can I do that? I, but I not future Timothy, but future Nino. Can I send it to yeah. my... Let's go do it here. I'm just okay. going to write mine over here. Okay. 
What was that? I don't know where I will be leaving at the time. Well, see, if you send the postcard now, future you is any time after now. So you're good. Okay. So the address is future. <laughs> yes. <laughs> see, you had a great time at I smiley face. Are you still writing the address there? Yeah, it's quite long, so <laughs> I'll get there. Are all the addresses in Georgia long? Uh, no, not really, not really. Okay, so, but you had uh, yours written, so that was cheating. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey. <laughs> it's okay, we'll wait. Okay, I hope you're doing well. Take care. I'm, I'm so nice to myself. <laughs> Take care and good luck with your startup. I have a startup. Okay, great. So. Well, uh, I think we got to mail them. Okay. <laughs> oh, there was more. More designs. Next time. Okay. Okay. Go. Bye. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, let's check out what this wall is all about. Going? It's going well. How are you? I'm um, great, thanks. Having a great time here. Hey, it's a developer festival. How, how could you not have a good time? I have no idea, honestly. It's beautiful out. It's an awesome time. So tell me what's going on with this wall. It's more than just a wall, right? It is more than just a wall. So this is actually going to be an AR mural. So as you can see, there's a lot of little icons and things on the screen. If I actually put up my tablet here, you can see that there's actually going to be floating overlays. So this AR is being generated because of those triggers within the actual mural itself. So there's a couple of different icons and different animations here. So here you can see it be the Google icons. In. And so what we've been doing today is just taking little short five just second GIFs for people and then being able to send them to them so they have something as a kind of a memento of today. Awesome. I love it. One? I do. But awesome. can you send me a GIF, not a GIF? Uh, I don't know about that. Eh, yeah, whatever. Okay. Preview. So there you are, jumping around in the background. What do you think? <laughs> That's very cool. It's got the heel click and everything. Exactly. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome, of course. All right, let's go somewhere else. Wow, that was fun, wasn't it? Good afternoon, hello. Hello, everyone. All right. I am Purnima Kochikar, and my team has the privilege of working with apps and games developers globally. The animation you just saw is inspired by the amazing content you create, which gives people superpowers and helps us move the mobile ecosystem forward. Thank you. Before we jump into what's new on Google Play, let's take a moment to look back at the amazing growth we have seen since we met at I.O. a year ago. You heard at the keynote that Android and Play are being used by increasing number of users around the world. Android is now active on 2 billion devices monthly, 
and an astounding 82 billion apps have been installed from Google Play in the last 12 months. This is translating into more developers finding success on Google Play. In the last year alone, the number of developers with more than 1 million installs grew by 35%. This is phenomenal and makes me truly happy. Give yourselves a very big hand. We are also investing to enable everyone to pay for your apps and games using forms of payment that they prefer. For example, Americans prefer credit cards, Japanese prefer DCB, and Germans prefer PayPal, and Brazilians prefer some kind of a prepaid method like gift cards which give them control over their payments. The sheer scale of our payment platform that you see behind me continues to amaze me. As a result, we are seeing that increased number of people paying for your apps and games than ever before. In the last year alone, the number of new buyers on Play grew by 30%. In particular, we are seeing great traction for the subscription business model. The number of subscribers grew by 2x last year, with 62% of the subscribers telling us that they use their app at least once a day. Beyond payments, we are also investing in capabilities to help you reach more users in more ways. The Play Store is now available on Trade in VR and on Chromebooks that allows you to reach users in interesting new ways. Last year at I.O., we previewed Android Instant Apps. This allows your users to get access to your apps without the hurdle of having to install the app. We are very grateful to many of you, I can see you in the audience here, who worked with us to make that vision a reality. And today, we open up Android Instant Apps to everyone. I hope you'll all start working on them. Um, beyond, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, and yesterday, uh, we, we previewed Android Go, uh, which is our optimized version of Android for emerging markets devices. As you know, there are billions of people in emerging markets who are coming onto mobile for the first time. Please take the time to look at the Building for Billions guidelines to help you build for these devices. Above all, we are taking into account quality in every decision we are making on the Play Store. Through programs like Early Access, we are bringing you dedicated and highly motivated 23 million plus people who are willing to test your apps and give you feedback while they're still in development before you put it up for production. We are engaging with Indies around the world to find the best quality games, and we're showcasing them on the Indie Corner. And we are also taking into account engagement in all our algorithms that shape our top charts. And today, this evening, we will host the second annual Google Play Awards. We will be celebrating the best of the best acknowledging great quality in apps and games. I hope to see you there. Please come, be inspired, and come to celebrate what makes great apps and games. So just as your apps are giving people superpowers, our engineering and product teams are working on capabilities to give you the superpowers to succeed on Google Play. So are you ready to see what they've been cooking? You can do better than that. All right, put your hands together for Matt Henderson, Group Product Manager. Great. Thanks, Pranima. Hi, everybody. So in your organizations, who else besides you cares about the success of your app? Who else contributes to the success of your app? 
a lot of people, right, in a variety of roles. Well, have a think about who else in your organization should be using the Play Console. When we started the console five years ago, it was a means to get an app from A to B, from developer to the phone. But over the years, it's become much more than that. With a variety of users and a variety of features, the Play Console is playing a much broader role in the success of your app. With more features, the user base has brought into different roles in your organizations. Our users now are product managers, they're marketing managers, they're test engineers, and of course, they're Android developers. So think about who else in your organization should be using the Play Console. Now, with that growth in the variety of features, UI design needs to keep things organized. So in addition to talking about features today, I wanted to touch on the UI look and feel of the console. You may have noticed some changes. We've launched a new, cleaner and clearer material design-based Play Console. And it has a new name. The Play Developer Console is now just the Play Console. This reflects the fact that although all of your organizations develop apps, not all of you are developers. The user base is getting more and more diverse as we're playing a more diverse role in the success of your app. And early feedback about the UI suggests we're on the right track, such as this from the e-commerce app Zalando. The redesigned Play Console is more intuitive it's more structured. It's more convenient. But of course, in addition to a new design, we've been hard at work with new functionality. So here are some highlights of launches from the past 12 months. There's been features to help app quality, like beta testing and the pre-launch report. There's new tools to manage the release process. There's also new reporting and pricing features to help you identify and take advantage of opportunities to grow your business. And now, at this I.O., we're announcing important new and updated features in all of these areas. They go even further at helping you create high-quality app experiences. They go even further at helping you mitigate risk in the release process. And they go even further in helping you to achieve business success. Now I'm going to hand over to some more of the team to give you a snapshot of each of these different features, starting with Fergus, product manager from the Play team in London. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Who here wants to know the secret to get a five-star app on Google Play? All right, great. You came to the right talk. We did machine learning over all the Google Play reviews, and what we found is that 50% of all the one-star reviews are talking about stability issues. So if you want to increase your star rating and reduce the number of one-star ratings for your app, the number one thing you can do is focus on stability of your application. OK, then once you fix those stability issues, what do you do to be able to increase your star rating to a, the, that golden five stars? Well, you focus on design, usability, and speed. Yesterday, in the keynote, you might have seen Android Vitals. This is our initiative at Google to help you be able to understand the performance and stability of your applications. We've had hundreds of millions of users who've opted in to share their device diagnostics and usage data with Google so that we can be able to help partners like you be able to provide better experiences. We're now giving you that data in an aggregate fashion so you can be able to understand your performance. We're starting with three performance areas, stability, battery, and rendering. We're going to be expanding to many more over the course of the next year, and so stay tuned um, for those. Now, as we expand to more and more performance areas, there's a lot of data to be able to understand. How do we simplify it for you? Well, we're introducing this concept of bad behaviors. Bad behaviors are when your app falls in the lowest 25% of apps for that metric. And if you are in the lowest 25%, we'll flag you as being in the lowest 25%, and 
and you'll be able to understand that you should prioritize fixing your app in that area. So the first area is stability. This is all about providing a robust and stable experience to your users that is reliable. There are two performance areas, uh, two performance metrics within this area. The first is your A and R rate, or application not responding rate. This is when your app freezes for more than five seconds. Second area is crash rate. This is when your application uh, free it closes on the user. The second performance area is battery. So this is where your app is using the radios or the CPU unnecessarily. And the two performance metrics that we're focused on here are stuck wake locks. So this is where you hold a wake lock for more than an hour when the device is supposed to be idle. And the second one is wake ups. This is where you're waking up the device more than 10 times per hour when the device is idle. The third performance area is rendering. So this is providing users with that silky smooth experience on their device so that they feel like your app is responsive and fluid. The two areas that we have in this uh, metric are slow rendering. So this is when 50% of your frames take more than 16 milliseconds to be rendered. So you're not achieving that 60 frames per second that users expect from their device. And the second one is frozen frames. This is where 0.1% of your frames take more than 700 milliseconds to be rendered. This is where users can actually really feel that there's a lag in the application. Both of these are shown in the Play Developer Console alongside all the other bad behaviors that I mentioned. So you can go to the Play Developer Console as of right now, and you can be able to see this data for your application. And then you can be able to focus on improving those core metrics. For each one, we provide uh, links to developer.android.com, which gives you help articles of how you can be able to fix these issues yourself. Finally, and if you don't care about your star rating, which I'm sure most of you do, we also have other reasons why you should care about this performance area. We're starting to use this performance data in the promotability in the uh, store itself, and other things that we're going to talk about later on today at 5.30 um, in a talk on the top 10 things um, to improve the stability of your application. Uh, you can be able to learn more about how we're improving the Play Store to be able to use this performance data. Now, I've talked a lot about the field data with Android Vitals. Now, I'm going to welcome Ricardo on stage, who's going to talk about how you can be able to understand the performance of your application before you launch it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Today, I want to talk to you about the Play pre launch report. The pre-launch report summarizes issues that are found when testing your app against a wide range of devices. We launched it last year in the Play Console, and you can find it there today. Pre-launch report actively contributes to the success of apps, and already thousands of you are already using it to create better apps. And I want to mention a few updates that we have about it. The key aspect of pre-launch report is app stability testing. We use a robot crawler to automatically test every APK that you upload to alpha or beta channels in the Play Console against several physical Android devices. The robot tells you if it encounters any crash during a five-minute crawl, which means that you can then fix the crash before it reaches production, and your users will not leave a one-star review because of that. In the past year, pre-launch report has seen great momentum. Over 58% of Play top apps have opted in into using it, and we have conducted over 6.5 million robot crawls across hundreds of thousands of APKs. But the number that they like best is not this one, but this one. In 85% of the cases when pre launch report found a crash, the app was not later pushed to production, which means that millions of users have not experienced these crashes that would have otherwise affected them, which is pretty nice. So we continually improve pre-launch report to make it even better. For example, to allow the robot to explore more of the app with data that you control, you can now provide test credentials that the robot will use to pass through login screens and explore more of the app. Pre-launch report automatically scans your app for vulnerabilities and privacy leaks using the knowledge of Google-owned security teams. Over the last year, we added new scans, and now we detect over 30 different types of vulnerabilities and privacy issues, from using obsolete libraries that have known issues to leaking identifiers. 
Pre-launch report also captures screenshots and videos during the crawl. We improve the way we capture them and we collect them, and we now take into account the structure of your app, such as the activities it's composed of and the transitions, to better cluster the screenshots intelligently. And this gives you a better view at a glance of how your app looks like across its various parts, which is great for spotting visual inconsistencies in your app look and feel. But this is the one that I like the most. We added new devices to the farm, including the Google Pixel running on Android O Preview. So that means that without any work, you can check how your app performs on Android O and be ready for when it, launch, uh, when it launches later this year. So you can go and upload an APK right now to uh, the Play Console in Alpha and Beta. And there's a good chance that by the end of this talk, you get a sense of how your app performs on Android O. Or at worst, it might take an hour. So this is all I have for you today. I hope the pre-launch report gives you that sense of amazing security that other developers like Playdemic are already finding on it. And I would like now to introduce on stage James Smith, product manager on Play. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. Hi, everyone. As Android developers, one of the most important things you have to look after is your app signing key. Because your app signing key ensures the security and integrity of your app. Lost or compromised keys can be a very serious issue. Your private key is required for signing all versions of your app. If you lose or misplace your key, you will not be able to publish updates to your app. Your only option would be to publish a new app under a new package name and ask all of your users to move across. This would be obviously a terrible experience. So that's why we're very excited to be launching Google Play app signing. If you join this program, Google Play will manage your key on your behalf and sign your app before delivering it to users. It's really easy to get started. First, you securely upload your app signing key to Google Play. That means it is now safe on Google servers, and you don't need to worry about balancing security and convenience of access to your key. You can even delete it. Now, to make sure that updates to your app come from you, the authorized developer, any new APKs you upload will be signed with an upload key that Google uses to verify your identity. The upload key can be reset, which avoids the key loss scenario I described earlier. We've had several partners using Google Play app signing for a while, and the feedback has been really positive. Here, Robinhood speaks to the layer of safety that we've added, while at the same time all but eliminating the worry of having lost or stolen keys. Now, once Google Play signs your app, we can go one step further, and we can provide optimization services at your request. The first optimization we've decided to focus on is making apps smaller. We know that developers care about app size because users do. APK size is correlated with download success and with uninstall rate. Looking at APKs, we can see that developers include native libraries and different architectures and drawables for different screen densities so that apps look and run their best on every device. But this means that a lot of the contents of an APK is unnecessary for every device. If I have a phone with a 32-bit architecture and a HDPI screen, then I only need the contents of the boxes in blue in this diagram. And the rest in green is completely unnecessary for my device. With app optimizations, Play will deliver just the right content for each device. You give us a universal APK, and we will automatically create optimized APKs for different devices. We're just getting started exploring this area, and it's still early. But we've tried this out with apps that were in our early access program, and we expect the average signing to be about 15%. However, some apps have seen better results. Deliveroo was 33% smaller after optimizations. And the seven-minute workout app was nearly a half smaller at 48%. So when can you get these benefits? Well, app signing is available today. 
We are trialing app optimization in beta with a few partners at the moment, and we hope to widen the beta in the near future. If you're interested in optimizations, please enroll in app signing today. And if you'd like to find out more about these topics, please come to our talk at 2.30 this afternoon on stage one. Thanks. I'd now like to invite Mike, the engineering manager on Google Play, to talk about Device Catalog, which is also available today. Thanks, James. So as we saw at the start of this talk, the Android ecosystem is seeing significant growth. And this is in part due to the diversity of Android devices with a range of different capabilities and price points. We hear that you love the reach that this brings. But understanding this device space and targeting the right devices can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. And so to help with this, we have launched a new device catalog section in the Google Play Console. Thank you. <laughs> Using everything that we know about Android, we've gone from this long list of device codes to a rich, full-featured device catalog. Looks pretty awesome, right? So what can this do for you? First of all, we provide detailed device specs including RAM, system on chip, GPU, screen size, and OS version for every one of the thousands of Android devices that are certified by Google. We also group these devices into models and allow you to drill down to understand the variations between them. To help navigate this device space, we provide search and filter options, allowing you to slice and dice the catalog by various device features. For example, you can use this to quickly find all SDK level 24 devices with the Snapdragon 810 SOC. Or as you see here, all devices manufactured by Google with more than 2 gig of RAM. And as you may have noticed, this is more than just device specs. With any filter, we also provide key metrics for how your app performs on these devices, such as installs, average ratings, and revenue. In addition to this, we've also introduced another new feature we call device exclusion rules. This allows you to exclude your app from a specific targeted set of devices using key device performance indicators. For example, if you're developing a rich graphics game, you could use this to only target devices with more than a gig of RAM. You could also create a rule to exclude all devices with a particular system on chip. This can allow you to temporarily prevent deployment of your app to a specific set of problematic devices until you can push a fix. Whenever you create an exclusion rule, we will always show you which devices will be excluded, along with installs and revenue metrics to help you make this important decision with confidence. As you can see, Space8 games have found a great way of incorporating these new device tools to reduce costs and improve KPIs. To hear more about this new device catalog feature, along with other release management tools, you can check out the recording of this talk that was presented yesterday. Also, please swing by the Play Console sandbox area in Dome C, where myself and other engineers from the console are available to give demos, answer questions, and hear your feedback on this or anything else relating to the Google Play Console. And with that, I'm going to hand you over to Suzanne to tell us about even more new ways we have to help you release with confidence. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and hello, all. I will walk you through the release dashboard, which we launched yesterday. You want to make sure that your production release is successful. We've always been ahead of the curve with tools to prepare great releases. Think about the pre-launch report that Ricardo discussed earlier, and our alpha and beta channels. But now, we also give you the data to monitor your production rollout out of the box without the need for an SDK. This data is offered in low latency and can help you make decisions about your rollout sooner and with more confidence. Let me show you a few highlights. 
When you push a new release, you obviously care about crashes. We give you absolute numbers, as well as crashes per 1,000 devices, to put those numbers in context. The default view shown here offers a comparison between your current release and the aggregate of all app versions that you have in production. If something does look off, you can then go straight to the crash clusters page to see if you introduced any new crashes. Releases aren't all about crashes, though. You also want to see ratings and reviews that are specific to your latest version. When the rating for your latest version is significantly lower than that of your overall rating, you may want to start looking into your one- and two-star reviews to see what's going on, and possibly even hold your release. But what if you could also see install events? Broken down by new installs and updates, this can tell you whether enough users updated to your new version to push your rollout onto the next stage. And think about the power of knowing how many uninstalls came from updated devices. Are you losing existing customers because your latest version isn't performing well? Play has these numbers for you out of the box. So I encourage you to think about what makes a healthy release. Your crash tool may warn you if you have a huge spike. Your PM may panic if your ratings tank. But what about subtle but significant changes across metrics? Would you ever notice if you didn't see them all in one place? And to empower your decision making even further, we also let you compare your release against a previous release of your choice. This gives you even more context. You don't only have your crashes and ANRs. You don't only have the impact that these are having on your ratings and on your uninstalls. But you can also see how these metrics compare to a previous release that you considered successful. All in one place, all within hours of your release starting, helping you minimize the time a bad release spends in production. So next time you roll a new version out, monitor it with the release dashboard. It is the new topmost item on the release management. And now over to Preston, engineering manager, to talk you through the new statistics pages. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. We've been hard at work this year addressing your top requests in play statistics. I think you'll be quite pleased with what we have to share with you today. I'd like to introduce the new play statistics page. From this snapshot, you can start to see, the, the, start to feel the magnitude of effort we've put behind the stats experience since last I.O. Right now, I'll briefly touch on just a few of my favorite features. First, let's drill down into date selection. As you can see, we still have the preset date ranges, but these presets are not sufficient for all app uh, business needs. So what we, we've, I'm happy to say that we've added a custom date range selector to let you choose the period that you're most interested in. Next, we know that many of you manually compare data in the console with data from previous time periods. We've made that process much simpler by plotting a comparison time period right alongside your selected date range. This allows you to easily see period over period trends that will highlight the impact of releases, marketing campaigns, and even public holidays. But time periods aren't the only thing we want to compare. Now on the Play Statistics page, you can select multiple metrics to compare at the same time. When you can easily compare related metrics, such as crashes and ratings or installs and revenue, you can start to uncover relationships in your data that are specific to your app and to your market. The last thing I'd like to mention is hourly data. We're introducing new hourly stats to help you understand the behavior of your app throughout the day. This knowledge will help you as you plan time-sensitive events such as releases. But to me, the most exciting part about hourly data is that you won't have to wait until tomorrow to start to see data for today. I think you'll agree that we've made play statistics more useful to help you build successful apps. I've only touched on a few of the things that we've added. I'd, li I'd invite you to come and join us in the, in the sandbox to talk about more. With that, I'll hand it over to Tamsin, our business development lead, to talk about user acquisition. Thank you. Thanks, Preston. 
So once you're confident that your app's health and performance is optimal, you'll probably want to drive new valuable users to your app, right? Well, in my job, I talk to developers every day, and they tell me how critical it is to understand how effective their marketing channels are at acquiring and retaining new and valuable users. They tell me they need more data to make the right decision about where to spend their money and where to spend their time and effort in optimizing their growth strategies. Since last I.O., we launched two improvements to the user acquisition report to make this area of the console even more useful for you. Now, just to remind you, the user acquisition report shows you how many users go to your store listing page, of those, how many people install your app, and of those, how many people buy and buy again. So the first improvement was that we added country to the user acquisition traffic breakdown. And this is really critical, because we want you to expand and succeed and reach those 2 billion monthly active Android devices around the world. Now, this report is great, because it will show you where the unrealized opportunity is so that you can prioritize your international expansion. The second improvement is that we added peer benchmarks. Now, this lets you see how your app conversion compares to similar apps in the same category who monetize in the same way. Now, this is it's available both in the acquisition report and in the country report. It's, <clears throat> so it lets you see obvious areas for improvement. It lets you see areas to further invest your acquisition and lets you celebrate your team's success. Now, I'm pretty confident that most of you here care about building long-term customer relationships, right? So today, I'm really excited to announce version two of the funnel, especially for businesses like yours who have a strong focus on user retention. It shows retention periods, which are a critical metric for understanding which channels are bringing you your most loyal users. And this is your retained installer base. It shows you the opportunity to increase retention using notifications and email or increasing your app quality. So from today, you'll be able to identify which channels are bringing you your most valuable users, which countries they're coming from, and you'll be able to identify the opportunities you have to increase your install and buy conversion and increase your user retention. Now, all of these reports help you optimize for your growth strategies, not just for installs, but for long-term business success. So regardless of the way you monetize, we have an acquisition report that can help you grow your business. Now, if you want to learn more about this, or the release dashboard, or the new statistics page, you should come to stage one at 1.30 right after this and watch uh, making data on Google Play work for you. So come and see us. Now, to tell you more about the improvements we've made to reviews, I'd like to welcome back on stage Fergus. Great, so I'm back again to help those people who had their hand up earlier about trying to get a five-star app on Play. We've made radical improvements to the whole ratings and reviews section on the Play console over the past year. I'm going to tell you some of those improvements we've made and we've just announced. So one thing we announced at Google I.O. last year was reviews analysis. This enables you to be able to see the topics that people are talking about in your reviews on Google Play and prioritize which topics are having the largest negative and positive impact on your rating in the store. We've heard from developers that they are using this to be able to prioritize their feature development. And we're now expanding to other languages so you can be able to understand what people in geographies that you have your app available in, but you don't speak the language, are saying about your application. So the second most popular language on Play is Spanish. And as of yesterday, we now have Spanish topics available in reviews analysis. And a major market for developers on Play is Japan. So we also now support Japanese topics. This is where we're putting Google's machine learning to work for you to be able to understand your users and what they're saying. A limitation on the Google Play reviews for developers 
over the past couple of years has been that when users update their reviews, you were only able to see the latest update of the review. Now we're enabling you to be able to see the full review history of the reviews that that user has left for your app unless they completely delete their review. This enables you to be able to have a fluid conversation with your users and be able to communicate with them effectively. So once you start engaging with your users and you start responding to their reviews, how do you understand if it's actually working for you? Well, we have updated rating section. This is where we show you what is the change in rating for reviews that you've responded to versus ones that you haven't responded to. And what we see is that developers are seeing major results in improving their star rating of their app by engaging with the users, because users in general update their rating to a positive rating as a result of engaging with them. Finally, another improvement we're making to the reviews area is the ability to be able to flag reviews that have passed through our first level of flagging that we do internally of reviews, where if you think that one of the reviews that is posted on your app does not match our posting guidelines and has been filtered through, then you can be able to flag it. And we'll do another manual review check and evaluation of that review to be able to determine if it matches our posting guidelines. And if it doesn't, we'll remove that. This has already been rolled out to a percentage of Play developers, and will be rolled out to the rest of all developers over the next couple of months. If you want to learn more about the secrets uh, to being able to get a high rated app on Play and increase your user retention, come to the talk we have later today at 5.30 to be able to learn more about the uh, things I talked about in Android Vitals earlier, things Ricardo mentioned in the pre-launch report, and these ratings topics that I just talked about. I'd like to welcome Tom, who's a product manager on Google Play, to come on stage now and talk about subscriptions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. So let's just imagine for a second that you guys have used all the great tools that you've heard about over this I.O. And you've worked with your teams, and you've made awesome apps. How do you monetize them? Well, we think one of the best ways to do that is to use subscriptions on Google Play. And one of the reasons we think that is because subscriptions are growing stratospherically. We heard from Pernima earlier on that the number of active subscribers on Play has doubled in the last year alone. That's great, but it's only one data point for a long-term trend. In fact, consumer spend on subscriptions on Play has gone up 10 times in the last three years. That's an amazing opportunity for developers like you to make more money more regularly and more reliably. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that probably sounds pretty good to quite a lot of you. And quite a lot of us at Google have been trying to help you, have been really working to power your subscription businesses. So today, I'm going to share a few of the slew of new features of subs that we're launching at I.O. this year. These are features to help you guys. Now, we know that to run a successful subscription business, you need really good data. So I'm really happy to say that earlier this week, we launched a brand new part of the Play Console, the subscriptions dashboard. The subs dashboard pulls together key metrics and information about your subs business and puts it all in one place. So at a glance, you can see your total number of subscriptions, your new activations and your cancellations, your daily and your 30-day rolling revenue, and even your top performing subs. This is a great area to get an overview of how well you're doing. It's brilliant if you want to spot trends or identify anomalies. And when you do identify an anomaly, you're going to want to know more. You're going to want to know even better data. And for that, over the coming weeks, we're launching three brand new click-through reports, each tailored to a key part of your subscription lifecycle. The acquisition report, the retention report, and the churn, the cancellation report. So let's look at them all really quickly. The acquisition report builds on the wonderful uh, funnels that Tamsin showed earlier. But now it's a funnel that's tailored especially for your business. So not only can you see which of your channels drive the largest number of installs, but you'll see which drive the largest number of free trialists, and which of your acquisition channels eventually drive the largest number of high-value, 
repeat paying subscribers. If you care about putting your money and your effort into the channels that give you the highest value users on subscriptions, this is the report for you. Secondly, there's the retention report. This powerful new report allows you to compare different cohorts from different subscriptions. So if you've got a brand new sub that you're experimenting with and you want to see if it outperforms your others, you can quickly and easily plot it and make that decision to make it the primary one that you sell. Or if you try to use some of our advanced features, like um, introductory pricing, for instance, um, then you can see here the impact it has on your burn down. This is a really, really good place to inform your product decisions to increase your attention. And lastly, there's the churn report. So let's be honest. When someone cancels your subscription, it sucks. But this report rocks. And the reason I love this report is because for the first time on the Play Console, you can see the exact days that people choose to cancel your subscriptions. This means that you can start seeing the impact of that release that you made to try to lower your cancellation rate. Or you can use this to start building the business model behind that feature that you think is going to keep people around for longer. Taken together, these three reports and the dashboard give you a view into your subs business that you have never been able to have on the Play Console before. But we know that the insights you derive from these are only the beginning of the story, because those insights drive your decisions, and those decisions drive what tools you choose to use. So I'm also really happy to say that this I.O., we're announcing a brand new tool called Account Hold. This will allow you to know when a user's payment has failed, which is one of the leading causes of subscription cancellations. At that point, Account Hold will let you withdraw the entitlement of your great content in your app and tell the user why. You can say, hey, there's been a problem with your payments. Go into Play and fix it. And the user will have 30 days to fix their payment failure. We've been working with trusted testers and trying this feature out, and we've seen a 25% increase in retention rates. So Account Hold and the new subscriptions dashboard are just two of the many features that teams across Google are creating to help you guys build successful businesses. Now, hopefully, that's whetted your appetite. So if you want to know more, I really uh, encourage you to come along to stage one tomorrow at 10.30 to join me and a couple of colleagues as we really delve deeply into how to make more money using subscriptions on Google Play. So with that, I'd like to invite back to the stage Purnima and Matt to round the session out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. So much new stuff. So in addition to making use of the sessions, um, please do go online to g.co slash play slash developers. You can read much more about all of this new stuff there. Um, and also think about who else in your organization can become a user of the Play Console. And also, if you haven't already, I do encourage you to download the uh, Playbook app. We've released a new uh, beta with a whole lot of new content. It's a great way to stay informed of all of our announcements, uh, our blogs, and other great content to understand the features. All right. So hopefully that has whetted your appetite to try to build amazing apps and games. And I hope to see you this evening at the Google Play Awards at 6.30, where we are celebrating all the wonderful work that has happened over the last year. I want to thank you for challenging us to continuously innovate, for adopting the features that we invest in, and creating things that actually provide superpowers to your users. So thank you very much for being here, and hope to see you at the Google Play Awards.
Hey gang, want to see something neat? Check out this awesome hidden feature I found in Firebase Analytics. So I'm over here looking at all my reports in the Firebase Analytics dashboard. Uh, here, for instance, I've got my active users for the last 30 days. And while these graphs sure are pretty, I'm thinking it'd be kind of nice if I could get these numbers into like Google Sheets or maybe Excel so I could analyze them a little better, right? Well, watch this. I'm going to select my graph here in the Firebase console. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see by like the highlighted text here that my graph has been selected. And then I'll hit Command-C to copy it. And then I'm going to switch to a blank Google spreadsheet and hit Command-V to paste. And uh, look at that. All my values are right there in the spreadsheet for me to analyze. So you can see here uh, on the leftmost column, I've got the date. And then all the actual numbers are in the columns next to it. Now, you might notice that I seem to have two columns of what looks like the same data, right? I've got monthly active users here, and then right next to it, I've got this monthly users column. And then the same goes for my weekly actives and same for my daily actives. And so basically, that first column is for the value that corresponds to the date here on the left. The second column is basically for that corresponding date in the previous 30-day time period. Uh, basically, it's the values that belong to this dotted line here in the graph that I copied. Make sense? OK. And then I can do the same thing for a bunch of these other graphs. Uh, here I can copy and paste my daily engagement numbers. Let's uh, get these into a new sheet here. And uh, again, you can see I've got my engagement numbers uh, from this time frame in this first column, and then those same numbers uh, for the previous 30 days in this second column. And uh, better yet, I can jump over to an individual event, like this completed five levels event, and uh, copy all these graphs here at the top. And you can see I'll get event counts, user counts, event per user counts, and uh, values for every one of my events that I am recording in Firebase Analytics. And uh, this lets me do some pretty nice calculations right here in Google Sheets. Uh, for example, let's say our game designer is curious how often people are failing a level in our game. Well, for starters, I've got my level start graph here uh, to show when people are starting a level in my game. So first, I'm going to copy and paste these numbers into a new sheet. Let's uh, put them in. OK, great. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my level fail graph. Um, and that will show when people have failed a level. So we'll copy from here. And we'll paste them right in next to uh, my other numbers. And once I've copied and pasted these values into Google Sheets, I can then calculate my average failure rate per game stat by dividing this number here by this other one. Uh, I'm going to copy this formula down for all of my dates. Let's uh, give it a percentage format so it looks nice. Uh, maybe we'll add an average at the bottom here. Let's do average for all these numbers. And uh, there we go. Looks like my game has an average failure rate somewhere in the low 30s, which sounds like it's just challenging enough for our players. So uh, our game designer is happy. Now, a couple of disclaimers here. Uh, first, this doesn't work on all the graphs I've tried. Some of them just don't seem to copy and paste as well as others. Uh, but it does work on a surprising number of them. You'll just kind of have to try them out and see if they work. And second, this will never be a replacement for some of the awesome and sophisticated data analysis capabilities you get by exporting your raw data to BigQuery. And you should totally go watch this video if you want to find out more. Uh, but if all you want to do is maybe compare two graphs to each other or calculate some standard deviations or averages on a particular event, this trick can work surprisingly well. So give it a try yourself, have fun with it, and we will see you soon on another episode of Firecasts. We're now in the IoT tent, and first we're going to learn all about OpenThread from Jonathan. All right, so OpenThread is an open source implementation of the Thread Networking Protocol. Uh, what it is, is a low power mesh networking technology that allows devices, IoT devices, to talk to each other uh, over a low power mesh network. So if you're building products that uh, run on battery that's supposed to last for years, not months, uh, Thread's a great solution for that. So what we've done at Nest is taken the protocol and made an open source implementation, uh, put it in our products, and made it available to developers to build into their own ones. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, you want me to walk you through the demo here? Yeah, and show me what's going on. So all these devices you see on the wall are actually running OpenThread. They're running our partner hardware. And uh, they're connected to a single thread network, one giant mesh network. And uh, one of the benefits of Thread is actually using IP, so just internet protocol. And each device has an IP address, an IPv6 address to be specific. So, and that makes it really easy for developers to build apps because it's just IP that they're used to. So if you can ping a web server, you can ping a, a thread node. So in this demo, we're actually showing pinging a device, 
over the thread network. So as you see that light blink, uh, it's actually going over Wi-Fi from a tablet to this Raspberry Pi, which happens to be on Wi-Fi, and then fanning out to the thread network. And you can imagine sensors or actuators like door locks and windows um, being replaced by a LED, but we're just simplifying it with this de demonstration. It's really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, before we go, actually, uh, if developers want to get started, where do they go? Sure. Uh, it's been publicly available for the last year. We launched it at Google I.O. last year. Uh, and you can go on github.com slash openthread slash openthread. Uh, there's code labs available if you're here at Google I.O., but it's also available on the Google Code Lab website for you to try out on, at home. I see a golden retriever. It's a golden retriever. That's pretty great. So we're in the... Android Things room, and I'm here with Ryan and Wayne. Ryan, tell us about some of the stuff that uh, is built on Android Things in this room. Cool. Uh, do you want me to hold it? Sure. All right. Um, uh, so over here, we have um, a simple demo that, wants to, that we are using to show how easy it is to uh, go from prototype to production with Android Things. So at the top, we have a very simple light that's turned on using a Intel Edison kit. Over here, uh, we're using the design, but we used a custom PCB to um, make the footprint smaller. Uh, therefore, you can fit the overall thing into smaller form factor. At the bottom, you can see in the candle. Actually, the really cool part about that demo is that any developer can make a circuit board like that. So in our talk tomorrow, we're going to show how to actually build that circuit board. And you can actually solder this up in your own workshop or home. So it's actually one of the really cool things about the SOM architecture is you can do that. Yep. Uh, on the right, we have the TensorFlow camera demo. This is also running on Android Things. We have Raspberry Pi 3 camera. Um, and it's actually fairly easy to build as well. All these parts are off the shelf. Um, so you'll notice Battery that too. it's running on battery, completely portable. Uh, and the best part is uh, it's actually running offline, completely locally on the device. Uh, so we're running the TensorFlow model, uh, TensorFlow Inception model you can get uh, online. And then once we download it, install it as an APK here. Uh, now you don't need online at all, so you don't need data cost associated with it at all. So when I press this button, it will take a picture using the camera module located here. Uh, and then it'll be processed on the device, and it'll say what it thinks it is using Android text-to-speech. Tell me about the M&Ms over here. So on this one, this was actually built by one of our external developers in our community, uh, Lewis. So the Smile Candy Dispenser, uh, it's powered by Android Things using Raspberry Pi 3. And uh, once you press this button, the camera will take a picture of you send it, send that image uh, through Cloud Vision API, and if it detects a smile, it'll give you the candy. And we're using a relay module, as you can see here, connected to the motor of the dispenser to activate the dispensing. All right, y'all. Well, I think that's all the Android things that we're going to check out in this booth. Uh, Wayne, before we get going, what are some things that developers can do today to play with Android things? Well, the really cool thing is all these samples here, we've open sourced all of them. So the TensorFlow image recognition, the LED candle, we've released all the source code on GitHub. The schematics for the candle are also available as an actual circuit design, so you can actually make them yourself. Um, so you can try all these things out, and then it's really easy to get started. You use Android Studio to write your code, and it's really easy to get going. So any Android program who's written a phone app now has the ability to make IoT apps as well. So that's one of the really cool things about Android Things is it takes advantage of all of your existing Android knowledge and allows you to apply it here. All right, we're now in the Works with Nest room, and I'm here with Jesse, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, Works with Nest. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. So Works with Nest is a developer program for Nest, and we have a bunch of different APIs that let you connect into the Nest ecosystem. And there's a lot of ways that you can connect. You can connect to the thermostat, the camera, the smoke alarm, um, and then also our uh, demand response programs that we set up with uh, utility companies cross country. That's awesome. So what are your, some of your favorite integrations with the Works with Nest program? So some of the really cool ones are uh, oh, over here, the Aware. It's a uh, air quality sensor. And uh, it'll measure the different things in your air. And then how it integrates with Nest is it uh, it connects to the thermostat and uses the fan to clean up the air in your house when it detects that levels are high. Oh, that's cool. What else? Uh, another one that's really cool, which is a little different, it's not directly connecting with the 
they're all over. <laughs> uh, product is uh, the Rachio sprinkler. Okay. So I have that in my house. It manages the water automatically, so I don't have to worry about it in my yard. But uh, with Nest, it uh, it shows up in my home report every month, where Nest tells me how much energy I'm using with my thermostat. But then I also have a uh, list of how much water I've used and compares it to the previous month. Pretty cool. Cool. So that's some of the stuff that's been around for a little bit. What's next? What's like the newest integrations? So some of our new things are with the camera. Okay. So the camera is now connected to the thermostat or to the, <laughs> the, the APIs, and uh, we're doing cool new things there. So originally you could uh, use the APIs and get motion events and then have your products respond to motion in the house. But uh, lately we've been developing our, uh, our image vision, and uh, now we can recognize people. So now Works with Nest products can get these people events and do things when they know that there's a person. Uh, one example is uh, not necessarily with people, but uh, cool integrations with the camera is Chamberlain and garage doors. So what they do is when the garage door opens, they grab a snapshot from the thermostat and they integrate, integrate that in their history UI in their app. That's awesome. Totally. Okay, so one last question, because we also checked out OpenThread. Is there anything in here that's using Thread? Absolutely. So super excited about Thread. Uh, it's really like the next phase of our development program. So the first one is giving people an easy way to connect to Nest products. And then phase two, we're going to take some of the core technology that we've developed at Nest to build our Nest products and make it available for developers. So we're working with Yale on this lock. Yale's been making locks for 50 years, 100 years, and uh, they're really good at it, but uh, not really a software company. So we've taken some of the software that uh, we use on our Nest products, like Thread, and uh, made it available to them. And it's going to be a really cool lock that's integrated with the ecosystem. And We've actually open sourced Thread, and we have a booth, just a couple booths down, where you can see all about it and figure out where to get the code. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to tell to all the developers out there? Check out the code labs. We have an open Thread code lab. We have one with uh, the camera that integrates with TensorFlow. It's uh, fun stuff that you can do uh, for the next two days. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you.